meeting is being recorded and of course we are using remote technology made available to us uh, during this pandemic uh, by uh, an executive order that Governor Baker issued way back in March and we've been taking advantage of it since then that allows us um, as a, a public body to still meet this way virtually. I've been very appreciative of that capacity. So we'll get the meeting started. Today is January 14th. And uh, for those of you who have been here from the very beginning, this is meeting 332. <clears throat> and I think that that starts to take on some particular significance as we go deep into the 300s. First um, item of business, um, I'll have uh, Councillor Grossman stand in today on the minutes. We have two sets of minutes, starting with September 10th. Todd and perhaps Carrie, correct? Should we do a roll call? Um, thank you, yes. I confirm visually, but we'll do a, a verbal uh, roll call. Commissioner Cameron. Uh, I am here, good morning, everyone. Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, good morning, I'm here. And Commissioner Zunica. Here, good morning, everybody. Thank, thank you, and we'll get started now with the minutes. Um, Todd and Carrie. Sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everybody. There are two sets of minutes in the packet for your consideration. Uh, those from September 10th and September 24th. And just for everyone's information, there are others um, that are on the way over the course of the next couple of as well. Uh, but um, why don't we put September 10th, uh, 2020 on the table first? Um, if there are any comments or questions, uh, I'd be happy to address those. Commissioners, are you all set? I'm, I'm all set. Uh, if um, if it's would okay, like I would move. I would move that they be approved as, as included in the packet, subject to any um, minor uh, um, corrections of typographical nature. Thank I you. second. Thank you. Any further discussion? I'll, all set. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. And I vote yes. So for um, record keeping, Todd, four zero. Thank you. Thank you. And the, the second set are from the September 24th, 2020 meeting. Same situation. Any comments or edits on those if you've had the chance to review them? Okay. No comments. I don't have anything, Madam Chair, but I'd be happy to move them. Um, with um, with any technical corrections that may be necessary. Second. I second that. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. I'll set Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. I vote yes. Thank you. Or the, zero. Um, the third set that's listed on the minutes, December 3rd, are not yet ready for commission review. So I'd ask that we just pull those down and we'll get those to you at an upcoming meeting. That's absolutely fine. Thank you so much. Okay, moving then on to the next item of business, administrative update. Good morning, Karen. Good Second morning, Madam Wells. Chair. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Uh, the first item, uh, item 3A in the administrative update, uh, is a presentation of a recommendation for the MGC Deputy Director, that's the Investigations and Enforcement Bureau Director. Uh, as the commission is aware, after I was permanently moved to the executive director position, that created a vacancy in the IEB director position. The, clear, the chair uh, included an agenda item for a public meeting where the job description was discussed amongst all of the commissioners. A uh, search process was convened by the chair and Commissioner Cameron, including myself and Director Griffin, with the assistance of the HR department. Uh, the posting is developed by the entire commission, uh, was not only placed in the state system, uh, the Toledo system, but also posted uh, to Noble, the National Association of Black Law Enforcement Executives, the IACP, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and the Dinner Group, which is a Boston chapter um, uh, dinner group. Is, that's made up of 1,500 uh, black professional men with a range of ages and professional levels. We did receive a tremendous response to the posting uh, with an excellent candidate pool. We had applicants with different types of impressive skill sets uh, and the review team was able to select from that larger pool uh, a group and conducted an 
interviews approximately 10 applicants who rose to the top of that group. Those interviews were conducted not only by Chair Judd Stein, uh, Commissioner Cameron and myself, but also Director Griffin to ask about approach to and understanding of issues of equity and inclusion as it related to the position. The interview process itself uh, highlighted that this position was multifaceted and required a broad skill set. Uh, the director oversees five very different divisions in the Bureau with different functions. The licensing division, state police, the financial investigations division, the gaming agents division, and the office of the enforcement of the chief enforcement counsel. Uh, the team asked the same set of questions to all the interviewees on topics that touched on all areas of the position. And after an extensive review and much discussion, the team is recommending that the commission ratify the selection of Loretta Lilios to serve in the position of the MGC Deputy Director, the Director of the Investigations and Enforcement Bureau. The commission is very familiar with her work. She is an ethical, intelligent, highly competent professional. Aside from serving as the interim director of the IEB since September, uh, Loretta was the deputy director of the Bureau and the chief enforcement counsel for the last six years. Prior to that, she'd been a deputy general counsel here at MGC after being a loan to us from the attorney general's office. She served the Commonwealth as both, both an assistant attorney general as well as an assistant Attor district attorney in Middlesex County where she worked for over 14 years, rising to the positions of Deputy Chief of the Appeals Bureau and then Chief Legal Counsel for the office. And prior to her legal career, she led the conference division for Weingarten uh, Publications. You know, at this point, uh, I will turn it over to Chair Judd Stein and Commissioner Cameron for any comments about the position and the selection. That's, thank you, Karen. Yes, I do want to reiterate um, much of what you shared. Uh, first off, um, you know, I, I want to thank Karen and the HR department for administering a comprehensive, rigorous, competitive search process. Uh, Karen, we, we, we worked extensively to make sure we had a diverse and inclusive pool. Um, and as Karen indicated, the recruitment process produced a pool of outstanding candidates. I was uh, very, very pleased with our selection process, and I asked Karen to um, explain it in detail because it's important for Commissioner O'Brien and Commissioner Zuniga to really have full confidence in the, um, the, the recruitment process as well as the selection process. Uh, I would want to thank Karen, um, Director Griffin, and of course, Commissioner Cameron for bringing their expertise to the table. You know, we are very, very fortunate to have in our colleague, um, Eileen and, and uh, Enrique, the extensive um, expertise in both law enforcement and investigation that Gail brings to us. And we um, were very, very appreciative of her insights as, as we really assessed this outstanding pool of candidates. Um, I also want to thank those candidates, if any of them have followed the process and are actually following it today. Each of you, and it was, a, we interviewed a, a, a very good number of candidates. Each of the um, of you, particularly the interviewees, the entire pool was very strong, but the interviewees brought to each interview um, a perspective that really helped us learn. I don't think I'm overstating that, and perhaps Commissioner Cameron, you'll, you'll, um, you'll chime in on that. And for that, we're, we're very thankful. I think that that helped, it will help me in my, my role going forward, and I think um, you know, we will be able to share those insights in a way to um, eventually uh, to um, Loretta Lilios, if in fact she is confirmed and ratified today. Uh, so we thank that pool and each candidate that applied. And as um, you know, uh, Director Wells indicated, one clear candidate did emerge at the top, and that is Loretta, who has served in the interim position since September. In fact. At reviewing our minutes, it was our second set of minutes in which we um, we asked uh, Loretta to serve as the interim, and that was this near the end of September. I was reminded by that date when we reviewed the minutes for today's meeting. And as Karen said, Loretta has served um, and demonstrated really her her capacity to take on this complex role. Loretta is meticulous in the execution of her duties. 
She's a thoughtful manager and truly a team member and a utility player. Her interview revealed for us a depth of understanding of the complexities of this key position within our organization. And it also uh, revealed an understanding that we know will guide her going forward to make this position her own. Her leadership capabilities have been in the spotlight over this last year as she has guided each of us, and I'm talking about my fellow commissioners, as we've had to make very difficult and um, complicated decisions regarding the reach of COVID-19 and its impact on our licensees. And she has made sure to, to, um, to be um, vigilant about the <clears throat> compliance and the rigors of COVID-19 uh, protocols and guidelines, but she's done it with just the right balance of understanding and compassion that is mandated by our humanity at this very difficult time. And for that, Loretta, I am forever grateful. So um, I'll turn it over now to Commissioner Cameron, and then we'll, we'll proceed with a um, discussion for our fellow commissioners on how we proceed with a ratification. Commissioner Cameron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I too was uh, very, um, first of all, grateful to be asked to participate in this process. I always learn something new. I'm a big believer in a process. Even with strong internal candidates, which we clearly had, um, I think it's so important to conduct a process. And um, we did that, we did it with an open mind, and we really had some strong candidates, as, as uh, both Karen and uh, the Chair pointed out. So, you know, um, as far as I was concerned, um, uh, Loretta really needed to uh, come up on her feet to compete, and she realized it was a competition, frankly. And she did come in very, very well prepared. Um, not just, okay, this is how we do it, and I'm going to continue to do it this way. Came in with ideas, came in with a, with a working knowledge of all of the units within the Bureau, um, and, and frankly admitted to us that there was more to learn and that she was relying on supervisors and um, learning from them and engaging them in the process, which I very much appreciated. Um, you know, we've all been there when someone um, kind of wants to change things right away and, and it's really about learning from one another. And this process was that, and, and Loretta talked about that. She had uh, suggestions on how to strengthen the Bureau and uh, ensure the coordination with the other parts of this commission, as well as that um, coordination with, uh, with the commissioners. So that was, um, and that was all in, in, in an idea, how do we make this more effective? So I, I, I did appreciate that as well. It, it certainly wasn't business as usual. Um, also the working relationship with the licensees. I think as an as a acting person, you have so much on your plate that something like that could fall by the wayside and it did not. Um, Loretta clearly talked about that working relationship, uh, but, but that balance of really being, um, you know, enforcing regulations, being a strong uh, regulator, but still listening and understanding the concerns of the licensees. So I appreciated that as well. So the, you know, the outstanding interview in combination with a very credible body of work for many years with this commission, I was not fortunate. I came in from another state and, uh, so did not know any of the folks that we hired as far as their, their uh, work in other um, parts of state government. So, but just the work here over the years, as well as, um, uh, you know, the, the very strong interview certainly convinced me uh, that this was the right candidate for this position. And um, again, very strong pool of candidates, but I am wholeheartedly uh, recommending to my fellow commissioners that this uh, this is the right candidate for this position, and um, and we will be in very good hands if if ratified here. So thank you for the time to explain, and um, and um, we'll go from there. Thank you. So with that, um, yes, uh, 
commissioners, uh, we are recommending um, that uh, Loretta uh, be promoted to this position, but we want to give you the opportunity to um, ask Loretta any questions or any of the four of us who participated in the process. And of course, Trupti, I think, is probably available too if you want to understand some of the magic that uh, she performed to get uh, the outstanding pool. And I know in many ways that was informed by uh, Commissioner, uh, Direct, uh, sorry, Director Griffin's um, uh, insights. We are um, staying true to our commitment to make sure our hiring and recruitment and retention processes um, are inclusive and that they work to, um, to lessen the um, inequities that are in our system. So again, Jill, thank you for that. Commissioner Zuniga, do you have something on your mind? Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I don't have a question for Loretta. I have some uh, comments to make. Uh, if they're also relevant uh, at this point, but uh, if Commissioner O'Brien has a, a question, I will, I'll be happy to defer until that. Evening. Commissioner O'Brien, do you want to ask a question before we go into comments? No, I just I have comments. I don't really have questions. So if Commissioner Zuniga would like to go now, I can go after him. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Zuniga? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, uh, thank you for that summary of, of, of the process of that description. I have full confidence in, in the process. Uh, I think it was necessary and important. Uh, and I know, uh, you know, not, not just on, until now, but since it began, how diligent and how much uh, um, you took it uh, seriously. And I'm happy to, uh, to have that outlined here today. I also have full confidence in Loretta, which is what uh, the bulk of my comments are, are going to be about. Um, and if I may, um, and I was very pleased when I learned that she had been, um, she got risen to the, to the top uh, for all the reasons that you already articulate. So if I may, I'd like to go a little bit on memory lane um, and uh, talk about the early days uh, of the commission. And I know Loretta has heard me say a little bit about this and others have as well. But I think um, it, bears, it bears repeating a little bit um, because it's central to, um, to her uh, profile, her arc, um, and, uh, and the reason for which uh, I think she's earned this, uh, this promotion. Um, when we first were uh, conceived um, as, a, as a new commission, uh, there was um, criticism out there uh, for us in the public sphere for not having uh, gaming experience, even though there was quite a bit of relevant experience that, uh, that the early um, members of the, of the commission uh, brought. Now, and I'm not just talking about commissioners, I'm talking, I'm, I'm specifically thinking about us, uh, Loretta as well, uh, as she was one of the first um, uh, people who came in to this, um, uh, to this commission. Um, never mind that we did have a, a lot of relevant experience and we were soon going to acquire it in other forms um, and developing uh, some of that expertise. Of course, I'm talking about specific gaming operations, um, but I think what we did have then and we do have uh, now are the necessary skills and methods central to the job. And that is something that Loretta really brings and has excelled at. Uh, she's a prime example of somebody who's diligent, methodical, uh, humble, self-assured, and, um, and willing to learn and willing to understand and go through the method of um, adhering to our processes, regulations, uh, and that is something that is central to what an investigator uh, does. Um, it's, it's okay to be uh, shown and learn about uh, things that we might not know about. And I think Loretta has demonstrated that uh, over the years. And, and I think that is a big aspect of what, um, what contributes to her, in my opinion, uh, as you articulate, rising to the top. So I'm really uh, happy to have uh, heard uh, that she's being recommended. I'm in full agreement. And, um, and congratulations, Loretta, if you're uh, um, ratified, as I suspect you will be uh, later on. Commissioner O'Brien. I won't um, torture Loretta with a long comment <laughs> to draw out the process, but 
Um, I, I agree. I, I'm happy to hear there was, you know, a, a diligent search, et cetera, having been involved in the GC search. I do think it's good um, for the institution and the internal candidate as well to understand, um, you know, that they rose to the top. I'm not surprised that she did. I've known Loretta, uh, hearkening back to the Middlesex DA days and, you know, crossing paths at other entities when I, when we both worked in state government. Um, and she, as everyone has said, is, you know, competent, intelligent, deliberate. Um, and I think one of the better qualities for this job that will serve her well is um, pretty unflappable. Uh, I know I can sometimes get animated. I think some of us can. And even uh, animated, Loretta seems relatively calm in the moment, which I think will serve her, has served her and will continue to serve her very well, uh, assuming, as I believe it will, that she'll be ratified by this full commission as we finish up this uh, item. So I just wanted to say short and sweet, and I think we can move on to the business at hand. Great, so. Um, Madam Chair, may I just make one more comment, if you don't mind? Absolutely. Thank you. I just I just wanted to point out that I very much appreciated working with Director Griffin on this process. Um, it, it really did provide a different lens and a very unique lens that I, I appreciated. And I just didn't know if uh, Director Griffin had anything to say about the process engaging with us and, and her thoughts, because I just I really did uh, think that was added value to the process to have a, a different lens. Uh, yes, involved. and Jill, you're back in uh, with your video. Uh, before, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> Commissioner Cameron reminded me, I did want to ask you to chime in. So um, I think that you heard us say how valuable uh, your, your, your expertise in, in, um, is guiding us, not only on this process, but really across the agency and so much of our work. And so I think um, I, I can uh, repeat what Cam Commissioner Cameron said, is that your um, value was really um, full demonstration to us during this process. And I think that we also, as I said, know what's going on throughout the organization. So do you want to chime in? And, uh, and again, Trupti, I don't know if I see her, but um, perhaps you can speak to her, the work that you did with her too. Um, so Trupti and I worked together to make sure that um, the position was listed broadly and and specifically in various outfits. I think um, we also asked the commissioners for suggested um, places to post the position. And, um, and I would just reiterate, uh, first, thank you for your kind words, but um, I would reiterate that this was a very competitive process. It was tough and the interview questions I thought were really tough. Um, you know, so um, I would reiterate that Loretta was the clear candidate that rose to the top and, and um, just add my comments to um, endorse um, Loretta, so thank you. I'm going to add one other observation that I think um, if there were outside cameras on the process, they might have noted. And that, of course, we did this all virtually. And of course, that means we had boxes of faces. And um, all four of the Gaming Commission representatives from Massachusetts were women. And I am extremely proud of that. Uh, and now we are adding into another leadership position. Um, you know, if this vote takes place, as I'm hearing it will, um, another woman uh, to our leadership positions. And um, that wasn't necessarily intentional, but it is noteworthy and remarkable given the industry that we um, work in. So, um, it wasn't lost on the four of us, nor was it necessarily lost on our interviewees. So I wanted to note that. Um, so thank you, Jill, for your wonderful comments. Karen, do you have anything else to add in? Uh, nothing further. I think, uh, I think everyone really summed it up very well. Okay, excellent. Then we will um, uh, engage in uh, the ratification process if there are no more questions on the process or our recommendation. You know, I bring to the table um, a recommendation that we um, promote uh, Loretta Lilios to what is the MGC's deputy director 
director of the IEB. Um, and with that, if anyone wants to make a formal motion or if there's any further discussion. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to make the motion that um, we in fact ratify um, uh, Loretta Lilios to be the director of the IEB. A I second. second that motion. Thank you, Commissioner Zuniga. All right, no further discussion. All right, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And an enthusiastic yes for me. Congratulations, Loretta, and we would love to hear from you. And I think I'm already seeing a couple of chats coming up, so. Congratulations, well-deserved. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, Karen, uh, Jill, and Troopty. Thank you for the kind words and, uh, and for this opportunity, for your confidence in me, and for your support uh, that I know you will have as I move into this new role. I have a full appreciation for the important responsibilities of this position, important to the commission, to the licensees, and, and to the citizens of the Commonwealth, really. Um, I fully intend and expect to work hard uh, to meet the challenges and to continue to advance the commission's agenda and mission. Um, I'm very excited to work in the new role with you, Chair, with Karen, with the commission, and with my uh, very talented and, and dedicated colleagues in the IEB and across the agency. Uh, so I just thank you for the opportunity. Wonderful. Well, virtual applause. Thank you. Um, we, um, we have, um, we're very excited over this. Um, um, news and the, the official appointment, you are no longer interim status. So that means the agenda isn't quite accurate, but you're on for the next item. Uh, Karen, do you want to make the introduction? Yes. So uh, for the next item, uh, similar to what we've been doing for months now, which I think has been very productive and I, I found it very useful and I'm hoping the commissioners and the public uh, find it useful as well. But having uh, Loretta, our new director of the IEB and assistant director band, I just give an update of what's going on on site, what's going on at the properties, particularly with relation to the COVID situation and the restrictions that have been in place. Uh, which have been implemented by the Gaming Commission and also the restrictions you know, that have been uh, put in place uh, by the Baker Polito administration. So with that, I will turn it over to Director Williams. Uh, thanks, Karen. So Bruce and I last updated the commission that you're meeting on December 17th, so a month ago. And since that time, pursuant to the governor's order in, con and in conjunction with a parallel commission order, a 25% capacity cap uh, has been put into place at the three uh, licensees properties. The 25% rule went into effect on December 26th and it remains in effect until at least January 24th. So that means it's now been an, in effect for almost three weeks. Uh, and that of course is in conjunction with the closing time of no later than 9.30 p.m. and in conjunction with all of the other health and uh, safety requirements, the masking, the distancing, standardization, communications plan signage, and that comprehensive set of requirements that's been in place since the properties reopened in, in early July. Uh, the 25% rule uh, required the casinos to uh, quickly uh, prepare and submit plans to the commission as to how they would monitor and ensure compliance with that capacity limit. And it also required our agents in the gaming agents division to review those plans and develop uh, our own monitoring uh, protocol, which was quickly done. Uh, so I'd like to ask Bruce to uh, jump in and review for you the activity at the three properties over the last month uh, with respect to the COVID-19 uh, health and safety requirements, including the 25% um, uh, development. Good morning, First, Bruce. Good morning, all. First, on uh, behalf of the Gaming Agents Division and myself, I'd like to congratulate uh, Director Lilios on her appointment and say we're really looking forward 
forward to working under your direction. Congratulations. Laura. Thank you, Bruce. Thank yeah. you very yeah. much. And I, I uh, enjoy and uh, look forward to our uh, continued uh, work together. We're really excited that we got rid of that mean director. That <laughs> <laughs> Only kidding, <Jim>. yeah. <laughs> not, not quiet. She's still around. Yeah, I know. I forgot. I, yeah. <laughs> Uh, as far as the 25% order, since December 26, the three uh, properties have been in compliance. PPC's highest occupancy days were uh, was on December 26, uh, where they got as high as, uh, excuse me, December 26 and January 8th, where they reached approximately 19% capacity. MGM's highest day was December 26, where they reached 22% uh, capacity, but that was uh, due to a car giveaway, and the rest of the time they were back down around 19% as well. Uh, Encore's highest day was January 1st, where they reached about 19% capacity. The rest of the time they were down around 17%. Uh, overall, the uh, properties have done an excellent job at staying under the 25%. Uh, as far as additional operational is issues since the 17th, there really isn't anything substantial to report. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Commissioner O'Brien, do you have questions? I don't have any questions right now, no, thank you. Okay, we'll just see if the discussions ensue and prompt some. Commissioner Zuniga. Yeah, just curious if you have seen um, uh, any kind of um, peak hours or um, things that you need to manage more actively, uh, given as a result of a re reduction, or if it's essentially uh, also a part of the, the, the demand, if you will, that might have itself adjusted a little bit as well. It's really been around their promotions. And, uh, Commissioner, it's uh, uh, like I say, the car giveaway, uh, Encore during the, that uh, day had uh, uh, point giveaways and things like that. So that kind of spread out through the day. So that kind of added to their uh, uh, crowds and so on, but they spread that out through the day. So it, it brought it out and that's been true for both uh, all the properties. So this time of year tends to be a little slower time of year anyway. So, uh, you know, I, I think, we're kind of lucky with with that as well. Commissioner Cameron. Um, no questions, but it is interesting to learn uh, because I wondered uh, when uh, you know cutting back for all the appropriate reasons to 25% if that would affect um, uh, you know the demand and would they in fact have to turn some folks away but it sounds like that did not occur. Um, so that's that's interesting to learn. Bruce, could you just um, reiterate the the um, the top the highest number for PPC? I didn't quite hear it. Uh, they had two days, which was the twenty six, and uh, let me just see, and January eighth, and they were nineteen uh, percent. Or excuse me, yeah, nineteen percent. Those were their highest. And, yeah, and those promotional days. You know, all promotional days. Yes. Uh, so I think, Bruce, your point about that this is uh, not necessarily the, um, the 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 period of time or the season for heightened casino attendance anyway, competing with the holidays. Correct. Uh, it sounds as though they did have some good successes at the same time, notwithstanding all of the restrictions. That's correct. Uh, so they were pleased. Good. Um, yes. And I, I agree with Commissioner Cameron for all the right reasons. Those uh, restrictions are in place and we'll stay tuned until the 24th. And for those who may need a reminder, Todd, our motion that um, the vote that we took, can you just explain it? I know that you did that for um, for us uh, in a, to through a legal um, explanation, but a reminder to the public where we stand on our vote. Absolutely. Um, so the Commission had in place, of course, a set of guidelines that um, set uh, capacity limits. And uh, the governor, and I don't have the date in front of me, but as the chair was just referencing, um, 
enacted a uh, an order that limited uh, occupancy at certain places, including casinos, uh, essentially at 25%. So the, the commission incorporated the governor's uh, directive into our own guidelines, and it set the uh, time frame at the two week date, which I think was January 11th or thereabouts, if the governor didn't take any further action. And if the governor hadn't taken any action, the initial guidelines, the, uh, the uh, limits set in the guidelines would have kicked back in. But as it turns out, the governor did take further action, extending the 25% capacity. So by the terms of the commission's order, uh, we followed along with the governor's uh, extension uh, by operation of the order itself, and it didn't require the commission to take any action. So all that to, to be said, the 25% uh, capacity remains in place as long as the governor's 25% order remains in place. That's really the bottom line. That's why we didn't have to return for any reason. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Loretta. Do you have? I, I do. I I have uh, from time to time. I have reported to you on the number of COVID positives among the casino employees that we get notified of. So I'm prepared to uh, to do that uh, today. It's no surprise that we would see an uptick. Um, that would be consistent with the justification for the 25% uh, and early closing rules uh, in the first place. Um, but uh, to date, over the past approximately seven months since um, uh, the properties reopened, uh, we have been notified of a total of 147 positive cases arising in casino employees. Uh, and in each of those instances, the casino notifies not only us uh, at the IEB, but also the Board of Health. Uh, in the host community. Uh, and again, this is across all three properties and dates back uh, since early July. Uh, the State Department of Health is also aware of and is monitoring uh, these, uh, these numbers. It remains consistent with my other reports that the employees, these positive tested employees in the overwhelming majority of instances are reporting that they believe they contracted the virus outside of work, um, typically they are reporting from a household uh, member. Um, we have seen no widespread trend or widespread concentration in any particular employee department or uh, population in any on-site area of the casinos. In the rare instance where more than one person in a department uh, that has worked together uh, has uh, been a positive. Uh, there's uh, been immediate action to uh, quarantine uh, uh, close contact employees, test, uh, and so forth. And most significantly, uh, local and state public health authorities have been kept up to date, uh, including uh, there have been site visits by the public health uh, professionals as well. And of course, the licensees have been fully cooperative. Um, so that's, you know, that's the up-to-date number. Um, happy to address any, anything you'd, uh, any questions you might have. Commissioner Zinnica. Yeah, thank you for the update, um, Loretta. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, just one quick um, uh, question, if you, if you have that, um, you know, off the top of your head, or is it something that you could come back to us at a future meeting? Um, in general, people, employees who have tested uh, positive uh, in the past and have uh, uh, potentially, hopefully, um, um, recovered, can you can you speak a little bit about um, protocols or time frames for returning uh, to work? Is that any information that you keep track of, or what, what can you tell us in terms of kind of like what what happens after that? And the CDC and the DPH have guidelines on uh, that period uh, and return to work and uh, both for employees who are testing negative but have been in close contact as well as uh, those who have tested positive but have had no symptoms 
and those who have tested positive and who have been symptomatic. Uh, and the licensees are on top of those uh, guidelines. They're, they have on occasion evolved, uh, but they are monitoring those closely and their uh, HR and personnel policies uh, completely track the, uh, the CDC and DPH protocols. Thank you. Great. And um, but is it fair to say that at least a portion of those employees, after having uh, been, you know, quarantined uh, or or um, recovered or tested negative uh, for whatever period of time, is it fair to say that some have been able to return to work? That oh, that's my understanding. Now I don't ask for the notification on you know when they're coming exactly when they're coming back um, or. Uh, but it's my uh, full understanding that they are returning after recovery and after they've satisfied those uh, periods uh, that the public health officials have uh, have dictated. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron. Thank you. I, I think the most important thing I heard in this update is um, that um, the belief is that the licensees are doing everything appropriately and taking measures to keep employees and patrons safe. And then on the back end, when someone does, uh, in fact, test positive, really following all the appropriate protocols. So from the standpoint, I, I think that's what I'm hearing and that um, that's, that's really important that, that our licensees are in fact doing everything possible to, um, to keep folks safe. They are, they're working really hard. Commissioner O'Brien. Um, just to follow up also, I, I, we had spoken about this yesterday at Loretta, and as you said that this is, these numbers are not unsurprisingly, given the, the statewide search have gone up, but that they appear to be consistent with what we've seen so far in contact tracing, which is that they are for the most part, if not entirely being contracted off premises. Um, and I suspect and, and have trust that you will, but I just wanna make clear also that to the extent that as we move forward, particularly during this time period where we're peaking again, whether there's any change in what the contact tracing shows in terms of whether we have you know, passed a point where now we're getting some, either in certain departments, certain specific casinos or something like that, I would trust that you would bring that forward to us um, if and when that ever happened. I would hope, given how hard they're working and given what we've seen over the last seven months, we will not be seeing that. Uh, but if we do, I would certainly um, want to know about it. Absolutely. And Loretta, you and I have spoken about this. We, <clears throat> we do um, know that the, the experts in the public, you know, State Department of Public Health um, are monitoring all industries and the trends and looking for any cluster. So we would have, um, you know, while Loretta and the licensees are closely monitoring this, as well as the local boards, the state is, is keeping close track of all trends. And, you know, uh, to reiterate what we've, we've learned in the past is where there's highly regulated industries like ours, you know, um, the, the precautions and restrictions um, appear to be effective. With that, we can't be anything but super vigilant, and we appreciate, you know, to Cameron, uh, Commissioner Cameron's point, uh, the full cooperation and the vigilance of our licensees. And I think all of us can agree that we we have been able to really expect and uh, receive their full cooperation uh, throughout this difficult period. Which, you know, in a, in a couple of months, it will be a full year, right? So um, <clears throat> anything else to add, except again, Loretta, thank you for, and, and Bruce, thank you for the comprehensive reporting. Karen, I do think that we should probably continue to keep this on the agenda. Yes. Um, let's hope trends start to turn the other way um, um, because uh, there's a lot to look forward to mm -hmm. as the, the vaccine rolls out. So um, I think that that's right. And then Loretta, um, again, thank you too for keeping us informed along the way as well. Great, thank you.
So that, that concludes item three for the agenda. So uh, Chair, I'll turn it back over to you for agenda item. Okay, you're, you're all set. Nothing else, um, Karen, at this time? Right. All right, thank you. Thank you for the thorough report. Now we're moving on to the legislative update. And this is um, just a, as a preface is that we've asked uh, Jill Griffin, as you've already heard, um, we, we are tapping some of her her um, expertise and 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 it it's obviously uh, given her good work in in uh, the uh, uh, workforce and diversity um, work that she did in construction phase of the licensees. We knew about her expertise with respect to equity and inclusion, but she also uh, and with her teammate Crystal Howard um, has uh, the full capacity to help us on monitoring legislative development. And we haven't had an employee that's designated for that um, in, in any formal uh, uh, way. And, and Karen is assessing that now. So we've asked uh, Jill and uh, with Crystal's help to really work on uh, uh, helping us be able to monitor legislative developments and give guidance and of course, you need a, a, a good lawyer um, on the side to help you with all of that to decipher what's up. So today, I, you're, we're going to get uh, an initial legislative update from uh, General Counsel Grossman and Director uh, Griffin. I understand that Crystal won't be able to be here today, but uh, again, we thank her for her contribution. Um, good morning. Thank you, um, Chair Judd Stein, and good morning, Commissioners. Uh, so um, General Counsel uh, Grossman and I are here to provide an update on the legislative filing, specifically regarding the ethics and conflict of interest issues uh, relative to the appointment of representatives on, on the commission's committees and subcommittees. Um, and I just wanted to briefly frame the problem. Um, as you saw in my memo, um, the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee and the associated subcommittees, um, you know, were established um, to provide advice to the Commission on gaming policy and related mitigation manners um, as per 23K Section 68. The committees are comprised of appointees from municipalities and gaming licensees, amongst others. Um, by virtue of their membership, um, on the committees, these individuals are deemed special state employees. Um, the state conflict of interest law, um, chapter 268A, section four, contains several restrictions against divided loyalties. Accordingly, individuals whose employment requires some touches with the mitigation efforts related to the casino are generally precluded from serving on the commission's committees and subcommittees. This has made it difficult to fill the statutorily required seats on the committees, resulting in delays in scheduling due to quorum issues um, and, and sometimes meeting cancellations. Um, municipal and regional planning agency employees that are familiar with how gaming facilities are operated in their communities, again, may be in violation of the state's conflict of interest law if they provide advice to the gaming commission while also performing their local duties involving gaming related matters. So staff is exploring various options for moving forward um, as the previous agency filed bill HB 14 died at the end of the last legislative session. Um, staff has identified several options for the commission to consider that would streamline committee and subcommittee processes, creating efficiencies and allow staff to more easily meet committee legislative requirements for quorum. Moving um, forward with the legislation, would require at least one legislative sponsor by the current filing deadline um, as the agency filing deadline of November 4th, 2020 has passed. Um, the lawmakers at the start of a session can usually file bills up until um, the third Friday in January, 
but um, during the first day of the 21-22 session, um, they extended um, that deadline to, to allow um, bills to be filed until February 19th that are considered timely. So I'm going to actually, um, unless there are any questions, turn this over to General Counsel Grossman to um, describe um, the three options in front of you. Well, thank you, Jill. And um, if it's okay, I'd like to. I'm, I'd like to just offer my congratulations to Loretta. First of all, Loretta and I go way back. I'm very excited for you, Loretta. And for all of us, I know the IEB is in really good hands. So uh, congratulations. I just wanted to uh, say that to you publicly. I'm excited for all of us and you. So Thank you so much, Todd. Absolutely. Um, secondly, um, since everyone has just gone through three hours of ethics training, I didn't want to uh, spend uh, <laughs> any more time than you absolutely need. However, it is important to really be able to answer this question to understand uh, the exact section that we're talking about. So I happen to have a quick slide and with your indulgence, I'll just put it up for a second so you can see exactly what we're talking about here. This is the so-called divided loyalties section of the conflict of interest laws, chapter 268A, section four, as Jill already mentioned, it's sections uh, A and C. And I won't read it for you, but essentially section A uh, says that a state employee can't receive or request compensation from anyone other than the Commonwealth or a state agency, in this case, obviously the Gaming Commission, in relation to any particular matter in which the Commonwealth or a state agency is a party or has a direct and substantial interest. And the, the key uh, with that uh, phraseology is that the Ethics Commission, our colleagues there have suggested that Community mitigation itself is generally considered to be, or would be considered a particular matter in which the agency has a direct and substantial interest. And so paragraph C is similar, except instead of talking about receiving compensation, it says that a state employee can't act as an agent or attorney for anyone in connection with a particular matter in which the Commonwealth or a state agency has a direct and substantial interest. So essentially, the issues before us when we deal with the committee and subcommittee members are whether they receive compensation, whether they're acting as an agent or an attorney for someone other than us in the performance of their duties. And when it comes to community mitigation, to the extent that any of these members are municipal employees or members of um, the regional planning committees, then they are government employees uh, who may very well be receiving compensation or acting as an agent um, for someone other than us. And so that's why this has become an issue and it's become difficult, as uh, Jill mentioned, to seat people on these subcommittees. So what that means is there are a number of ways uh, that this can be addressed. And they're laid out in the, uh, the memo that uh, was prepared for you and that's in your packet. There are essentially three options. There are others, of course, but these are the three that uh, we wanted to bring before you. Option one, you've seen before, this was actually prepared uh, for us uh, by uh, our colleagues uh, from the Ethics Commission. And this is a very precise way of essentially um, exempting members of our uh, committees and subcommittees out of the divided loyalty section if they are municipal employees. Um, and the key there is that it only would apply to folks who happen to be um, municipal employees. And the reason for that is that municipal employees, just like state employees, are subject to Chapter 268A, the Conflict of Interest Law. So there are uh, laws that govern their behavior as government employees. And so this proposal here only applies to subcommittee members who happen to be municipal employees. And then it only really exempts them from section four, that divided loyalty section we just took a look at. Um, and it, it says essentially that by participating in the subcommittee, they wouldn't be violating 
Section 4 by expressing their views, even though in their day jobs they're still involved with community mitigation related issues. So that's what option one is. It's a very uh, specific um, and precise um, effort to go into uh, chapter 23K, section 68, and uh, clear up this issue. Options two and three are a different approach, and they're both based upon language that is actually in um, sta a statute that applies to the Cannabis Control Commission. And under the Cannabis Control Commission, as you may know, there's what they call the Cannabis Advisory Board. Um, and that's governed under section, uh, it says chapter 10, section 77. And they went in there when that law was passed and they, they said that members of that board shall not be state employees under chapter 268A, period, end of story. Um, so they didn't just exempt those folks out uh, from the divided loyalty section, they exempted them out altogether, essentially, from the state conflict of interest law, whether they're municipal employees or not. Um, so that paints uh, with a very broad brush. Um, and there are reasons for doing that as well. And some of the things just to bear in mind there is that these are advisory boards when it comes to the Cannabis Advisory Board or our GPAC and subcommittees, they're advisory boards to the commission. Um, they aren't making final decisions um, on anything. And I presumably that uh, weighed in and factored into the legislative and governor's decision to include language like that in the cannabis uh, uh, statute. And so options two and three revolve around that. Option three would be to propose language that just says flat out, uh, members of the GPAC and subcommittee shall not be state employees under chapter 268A. Uh, that is an option and that would exempt them essentially from uh, the conflict of interest law in its entirety. Option two, and I'm sorry for working backwards here, but option two is a, a slightly different subset of that. And we could just say that um, only members of our subcommittees who are also municipal employees uh, aren't considered state employees by virtue of their membership on the board, which would mean that they're not subject to the conflict of interest law by virtue of their membership on our subcommittee, but they are still subject to the conflict of interest law because they're municipal employees. So there are still ethics laws that apply to them. So those are the, that's a lot, by the way, that's a lot. This is a very complicated area of the conflict of interest law uh, to uh, grasp. And we all saw that in the past couple of days as we've gone through training in this. Um, so I, I think maybe I'll just pause there. Um, I don't want to overcomplicate it any more than perhaps I already have, but um, those are the three options that we would suggest um, are, are workable. Um, there are perhaps others as well, um, but those are the ones we wanted to bring to your attention. Jill, do you want to um, add in and before we ask for discussion? Um, so I would just say that um, um, all three options are workable. Um, some are more clear. I think the first option, um, as you see, was um, something that um, was worked out with the Ethics Commission. Um, but later on, with the, with the arrival of cannabis and the creation of that commission, we have a new precedent. So we wanted to talk to the commission and, and kind of get their input on these three options. Then we'll turn it over for discussion. Uh, Commissioner Cameron, are you leaning in? Or? I am, and I, I wondered since um, the cannabis option three is already um, kind of already out there, does it make sense? Is that an easier way to move this forward? and still um, you know, have the, the results that we're looking for here. And, and Commissioner, and before we answer that, Commissioner Zuniga, were you, um, is it, were you asking about the same or do you, uh, it's a distinguishing? No, no, it's, it's along the same lines. Um, just to confirm, um, options two or three, um, is one of them or both 
already in effect for cannabis, or is it a proposal? I, I, I understood three to be perhaps a proposal, but it's not yet passed. No, is no. three is the law. Op yeah. Option three is the law. Okay. For the, for the cannabis control. Cannabis. For the cannabis control, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I can offer you my comments now. I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bad predictor of what's possible in the, at the legislature, but it seems like, um, you know, Todd and Jill really, you know, through the memo and through their remarks, get to the core of the, the, the differences here, which is, you know, having the input of the, of the uh, ethics commission with uh, option one, that is a very surgical, if you will, specific, detailed and nuanced uh, exemption versus the, what's possible perhaps because there's already a precedent in the broad blanket uh, options um, two and three. In, in that context, I'm indifferent. I think each of them, um, uh, uh, you know, get to the same result, which, which I believe in, uh, by the way, uh, and it bears mentioning that um, in some cases, um, municipal employees with direct knowledge of the mitigation uh, needs are in the best position to offer advice uh, as it was intended in 23K to the ultimate decision makers um, who happen to be uh, us with the help of the staff and a very thoughtful process. Um, and it's only too unfortunate that because of the way it's structured, uh, we find ourselves often um, you know, deferring some of those meetings because of the lack of quorum, effectively. So um, I'm, I'm in favor of, of any of those uh, options, if that's what we're sort of uh, polling here, um, as long as they get us to the same, uh, to the same place. Commissioner O'Brien? Uh, the sort of a, another question on option three, the language of uh, chapter 1077A, was that in the initial statutory language or was that a revision? Um, no, I think, I don't know that that's a revision. That is in, um, and Todd, you can correct me. My, that's why I have an attorney here. Um, it, that's specifically in chapter 10, section 77A. And it appears uh, to be the original language. I, I, I know that legislative history is hard to come by sometimes yeah. in the general court, but um, while any of them seem to solve our purpose, if there's something already recently enacted, it would be probably helpful to see if there was any legislative history about why they chose that language for cannabis and not us. Um, if I could chime in on that, that's an important question. I'm not sure to, to Commissioner O'Brien's point whether you'd find legislative history, but when we look at um, the inclusive nature of option three versus option two, which would be more narrow on municipal employees, there could be, while we are very much structured the same way in our, our structure, we do have quite a different mission. Ours is focused on three licensees and communities in the area. Their work is commonwealth wide there could have been a reason given the nature of cannabis in that industry. And I'm not, I'm not, I don't understand that, but Commissioner O'Brien, you may be thinking the same line. There may have been a desire to make sure that individuals, private, you know, privately employed individuals, as well as municipal employees could serve without the burden of chapter 268A because they may have wanted some touches with the industry. And so they may have decided to give that blanket exception. And, and so, you know, I would think we'd wanna consider option three would free all of our committee members on GPAC and the three subcommittees and the LICMAC from all state conflict of interest legal provisions where I think option two and I think option one, Todd, correct me, focuses on what I think is our problem, which is where we want that municipal expertise. And, um, and we, 
they're reluctant to join because either they would have to recuse themselves all the time so they wouldn't be effective, or they actually will come against uh, that really complicated section four that, that always gets glossed over because <laughs> it's so complicated um, in our, um, our trainings. Is that fair to say, Todd, that, that three really would be a pretty broad move and not necessarily an immediate parallel comparison to cannabis and because of the different missions? Yeah, I, I, they are a little different. Um, and I, I also was just looking up the, the history of Section 77. It has been amended, but it doesn't look like they amended that particular yeah. provision. So I think that's been in effect. Yeah. So um, I, I, I'm not comfortable saying that for sure, but that's the way it looks um, initially. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's also, it is to, to your point, uh, Kathy, it's important to, uh, excuse me, Chair, um, <laughs> it's, it's important to um, remember the reason why I think our colleagues at the Ethics Commission were comfortable uh, carving out this exemption in the first place, and that is when you are a municipal employee, your private interests are less likely in this type of context to interfere with your objectivity, which is the whole purpose of the divided loyalty section. You're already a government employee who has the public interest at heart. And so the fact that this section uh, is in place doesn't necessarily achieve perhaps what it was initially intended to, which is to ensure your objectivity in your service to the state government. Um, so that's kind of where the carve out came from. Of course, when you, that's the narrow carve out, the broader you get, um, you kind of lessen that. But the, the counter again, being that these subcommittees aren't making direct decisions about anything. Um, they, ultimately the commission decides what the guidelines are, whether applications are approved, all of that kind of stuff. So there are filters. Um, that all of these things have to go through. Um, so, you know, it's hard to say why different approaches were taken in different contexts, as the chair uh, pointed out, but, um, you know, there, it's, it's just basically a risk tolerance kind of thing, and what do you think actually, where the risks actually lie, I think. So, you know, could I add? We, yeah, go, go ahead, Chair, yeah. I, I think, um, one other option um, or reason could be that um, the legislature was informed um, by what the commission has gone through and um, made those changes um, based on information um, regarding our advocacy and, and um, education about our issues. I, I agree with that. It is possible. I, I mean, uh, because we've been submitting comments about this issue from early on, and uh, only because um, cannabis uh, was also um, modeled, as you correctly point out, uh, uh, Chair, that um, after some of the, a lot of the language of 23K. So it's possible that they, they, they came together when they, when they drafted them. Um, I had a, uh, you know, a comment about, you know, as we present, uh, and, you know, this um, to the legislature, uh, we could simply present all those three options with this, you know, with a similar, for, for them to decide. Um, could we not? I, Jill, I do think you want to? Uh, sure. Yeah, well, go ahead, Commissioner O'Brien. I know that Jill has some insight on the process that would be expected. So, Commissioner O'Brien, did you want to chime in first? I, I think my instinct would be that, you know, we know the, we've been thinking about it, and I, I think the better approach is to go in with our preferred option. Um, but, Jill, I defer to, you know, I, I'm happy to hear what you have to say, too. I think, um, Chair, is it okay? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, when your square lights up, we listen. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, my instinct is um, that uh, we would talk to legislators about our preferred option, and um, it would be up to them um, to make changes or recommendations um, uh, uh, moving forward. You know, um, they would need to file it. Um, I would say that a solution that is very clear and precise would be 
probably preferred um, and easily explained to others. And I wonder if option one um, has that clarity um, that is needed. Um, but that's just my, um, my personal comment. Um, could I ask another question too? Um, have either of you asked um, anyone in ethics what, whether they were consulted on the cannabis language and or what their thoughts would be on that as a solution? No, I can chime in here when I look at one, two, and three, Commissioner O'Brien. If I were, if I were guessing correctly, uh, and Todd, I'm sure this was probably your experience when you worked with them, and, and I think you alluded to this issue just now, is that the fix that they offered is very, very narrow and really addressed what was the problem that the commission was facing. And let's be clear, the commission was facing, we haven't heard from other appointing officials that they've been challenged on their appointments, but where we are looking for particularly local or where the communities are probably making their appointments, where the communities can appoint or designate and where we can appoint and designate, we're looking at those municipal experts and they're the ones who are really confronted by, if I'm right, Todd, that, that uh, section four divided loyalty provision. Where we start getting broader, let's say the GPAC Advisory Commission, that um, most of those appointments are by the governor and their commonwealth wide appointments with some have to be from the host communities and then just have different expertise. So probably those appointing officials may not have confronted this issue. So if you think about the, the ethics commission would always be inclined to go with narrow impact. Um, they do view these advisory committees as doing state work, which is a threshold issue for them. They could have said they're strictly advisory in nature and not subject to 268A, but they made that clear that they are special state employees and they suggested this narrow fix. If we went all the way down to the spectrum, it would be a much broader ask of the legislature. Um, it would be to exempt all members of all of these committees under section 68 of 23K to, to not be subject to any conflicts. So we might wanna make that request, but I'm suggesting that that would be a a different, certainly a different ask for the legislature to, to consider. Commissioner O'Brien, you're nodding your head, so I'll ha have you help me out here. No, it's, it's, that's why I asked the question, because they are, they are, they get us to the same result, but some of it has other unintended consequences. And so I would think the vetting that one proposed language would be the preferred option going forward um, for that reason because you are sort of dropping some conflict of interest protections in, some, in the broader language. Right, and, 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 and Commissioner Cameron, yes. No, I just, back to my original question, I think what's important is that we are successful. If, if, and if there's a way to be successful, I don't know that precedent out there with cannabis helps us to achieve that goal. And I certainly hear you that the preferred option would be more narrow but I'm just wondering if, um, because there is precedent, if that is an easier um, uh, way to be successful. I think we certainly point out this br much broader um, provision that's offered to the Cannabis Commission. I just wonder if that's what we really, do we really want the broader uh, relief or do we really want an, the narrower relief? And I think that might be the threshold question before we decide between one and two, do we want um, the subcommittee members who are perhaps private, privately employed to not have be subject to um, the special state employee status? Uh, do we see so risk where it is advisory? And, uh, you know, are we letting perfection be the, the you know, the enemy here of, of good and, and successful. So that's that was my only question is, how do we get there? And, um, and do we really see that much risk where it is advisory only? 
I, I would have concerns not only about that risk, but the appearance of impropriety or conflict. And so I think the narrower solution avoids the risk of an appearance of impropriety. So we're not worried about getting to the finish line as much as what what we think is exactly right. Is that right? Commissioner Cameron, I'd no, agree I, with you. I'd agree with you, except that I don't think we're hearing from the appointing officials that they're encountering this problem. Right. Um, I think, you know, for getting, you know, recruiting folks, that, I'll tell you, they, that always offers more relief. You know, when, when they have that in a statute that it's not subject to Chapter 268A, that opens up doors, absolutely. Um, I just don't know if, if, if that ask might be so broad to not make us successful. That's I see. Kind of no, that was my question, and I, I really did not have an opinion on it. I was really asking, um, you know, what yeah. we really think could be successful here since we haven't been successful to date. We, and it just may be a process thing, how, you know, we've done it before. We've got Jill Griffin at the helm right now, so that's a new starting point. Uh, uh, Commissioner Zuniga. Yeah, as I, as I hear the discussion, I'm, um, I'm getting uh, more comfortable with um, shooting for the narrow option one, the surgical approach, if you will. Um, even though there's this precedent with um, with cannabis, there's uh, perhaps you know differences that we might not know about in terms of how they compete cannabis that uh, you know are not necessarily applicable. Um, one of them it occurs to me. Um, and just want to verify if, if somebody knows do, do the members of cannabis are they uh, subject to an enhanced code of ethics? Uh, does anybody know? Tom? I believe they are. I you know I was I, I meant to look at it, uh, but I haven't. They are the answer is yes, they are. I okay. don't know what it says though. All right, which uh, again uh, maybe maybe is neutral or maybe is an indicator. But uh, given that we have an enhanced code of ethics and there was quite a bit of. Um, you know, a history on that, and uh, uh, not just on the legislation uh, side, but also for us in how we came up with it and have updated it. Um, perhaps the most prudent approach, you know, in that context for, for us is to, you know, to recommend the narrow one um, and, and explain it in, in that context. And then as to the language itself, if we went more narrow, Todd, is number two maybe just a more accessible language that mirrors option three, but achieves <laughs> option one, <laughs> if that makes yeah, sense? I, I, it does to me. Um, I, I think it's a good hybrid and kind of a, almost a compromise. And you can make the case that you're still only exempting out folks who are already subject to the conflict of interest law in a, their, their day jobs. So it's not like you're exempting them out altogether. Um, so that it is a, a good middle ground, I think. And, and how is it distinguished from option one then? Um, other than the link, you know, the language is precise around section four. Is, is the section four achieve the same? I mean, the section option one achieve the exact same thing as section two? Is there a little difference? It's Broad, right? Only. Because so, as you know, as state state employees, uh, you can't be involved in particular matters that implicate your financial interest or that of immediate family members. So that would be exempted out under option two. Um, you know, as as their oh. per their work on the subcommittee, uh, accepting gifts that would be exempted out under option two um, in their capacity as subcommittee members. Um, and you know the, the list of things that uh, fall under the conflict of interest law. As members of the subcommittee, they wouldn't be subject to those provisions. They would be as municipal employees in their day jobs. And that's the distinction between two and three. If you, under three, folks who are not municipal employees, if you exempt them out altogether from Chapter 268A and say they're not state employees, then there are none of those protections, which mm -hmm. you might say is okay, uh, but that's really the question before you. And those are those unforeseen consequences that I think Commissioner O'Brien referenced. Yes. Uh, can I ask this question? Um, I think Jill referenced, or and, and it's the Ethics Commission not only gave a blessing to option one, but crafted it. 
does it make sense if we were to sort of steer you in the narrower option to just check in with the Ethics Commission on the language of number two to see if, if they think it has that precision that will get it to that success point that Commissioner Cameron references. Um, Attorney General. Oh. <laughs> General was that, I'm sorry, was that a question for me? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. That's um, <laughs> not a problem at all. Well, what do you think, uh, Commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Cameron? That makes a lot of sense to me. Commissioner O'Brien? Yeah, I mean, that would address, I think, the question that I have about ethics thoughts on two and three. But I do think that if we're going to ask, two would be the sort of the presumptive close on our part. But if we were going to suggest that as opposed to option one, we'd want to know what ethics thought. Commissioner Zunica? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine either way. Are, are we all okay taking the narrow approach? Are, are we thinking that that rather than you know, exempt yes. everyone? Just so deal with I, our problem, yeah. Yep. Right, and I think now it's down to, is it one or two that has a better success right. rate here, right? Yeah. And what ethics thinks about two, that is an important piece as well. I think that will help um, if, we, if, if Jill's able to convey that to any legislative sponsor that we've gotten a blessing from the ethics, I see Commissioner O'Brien nodding, so yeah, okay. So uh, what do we need to do formally, uh, Jill and Todd, to move this? Do we need, uh, I think we preserve the vote. Do we have okay. enough of a consensus at this point for direction that it's unnecessary to vote? I think we are looking for feedback. I don't think we have a vote on the okay. agenda. Thanks. Um, but I thank you, you know, you provided some clear direction, so I thank you all. Well, Todd, that's an accomplishment clear direction on a really complicated ethics thing. So um, that's really uh, kudos to both uh, you, Jill, and Todd, and of course, Crystal, for helping navigate this, uh, this issue. Really helpful. Karen, you agree? On mute. Yes, yes, I think that's fine. And, and also good work on, on your team's part. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, yikes, I got to just get back to my uh, agenda. So uh, barring no further discussion, we'll move on to the next item, which uh, is- Ma Madam Chair, can, um, could sorry. I request perhaps a five minute uh, break? Absolutely. Before we move on. Yeah, that gives me a chance to find the agenda too. Thanks so much. <laughs> uh, we'll, return, um, we'll return at 11.32ish, okay? Thanks so much. I see that um, we're all back, but I will do a roll call to confirm before we continue. And I do see Director Van der Linden is, is visually with us. There we go. Um, so Commissioner Cameron? I'm here. Commissioner O'Brien? Here. Commissioner Zinega? Here. Here, so all four of us are here re resuming our meeting and now turning to, and again, thank you so much to Director Griffin and uh, General Counsel Grossman. That was a really helpful exercise. We appreciate um, the update and we look forward to similar updates on other filings and just generally with respect to legislation. So thank you so much. Um, and now we'll turn to item number four, or five, excuse me, um, responsible, uh, <clears throat> research and responsible gaming director, Mark Vanderlinden, and we're going to have a couple of items for you today, Mark. Yes. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, I am uh, here to talk to you for the first item about the um, Encore Boston Harbor's request to delay the implementation of Play My Way. Um, I see that I have uh, my colleague, um, Chief Information Officer Katrina uh, Chagro Gomez, but um, do we have uh, Jackie? from um, available. I am here as well. Thank you, Mark. Okay. All right. Great. Um, as well as Jackie Crum, who is a Senior Vice President and General Counsel for Encore Boston Harbor. Uh, morning, so just, so just quickly by way of background, uh, Play My Way is a budget setting uh, tool um, that allows players the ability to set and monitor their budget from electronic gaming devices. Um, since uh, it was launched at Plain Ridge Park Casino back in 2016, 
Um, over 26,000 individuals have enrolled in Play My Way. It has a roughly 14% unenrollment rate. Um, it's also worth noting that um, as we've advanced this, this project or this special tool, we've done so through a memorandum of understanding or agreement with our licensees as opposed to regulation. Um, in 2018, um, we, uh, along with our licensees, decided to um, advance Play My Way across all three licensees, not to just limit it to Plain Ridge Park Casino. Um, so in that MOU, there was an agreement that um, Encore Boston Harbor and MGM Springfield would launch Play My Way uh, by September of 2020. Um, in late March, early April, um, the both licensees um, came to the Gaming Commission with a joint request to delay the implementation by one year to September of 2021, um, largely and very um, understandably due to the, the um, effects of the COVID-19 shutdown and um, economic toll that that has taken on the, the industry. Uh, that request was granted. Uh, since that time, and in fact, since 2018, both licensees, um, IGT and the Gaming Commission have been diligently working together towards the development of, of Play My Way to launch at, at these two facilities. Um, MGM Springfield um, has, re, has, has assured us that they are still on track with the um, September 2021 launch date. Um, and we will soon begin our process of, of uh, planning that um, planning that launch. Um, Encore Boston Harbor has made a request to delay uh, the implementation further um, to September of 2022. Um, that is what the question that's before the, the commission today and, and up for discussion. Um, so with that, I think I, I would turn it over to, uh, or I turn it over for questions to the uh, commission, um, but also to um, Jackie uh, to kind of explain um, the situation more clearly from uh, Encore site. Makes sense to hear from Jackie. Okay, th thank you, Mark. Good morning. Uh, first, can I also add my uh, congratulations to Director Lilias? I, I can't think of anything that is more well-deserved, so congratulations. Actually, I don't think she's on, but anyway. <laughs> she's listening. She, okay. There she is. There she is. I am. Thank you very much, Jackie. Look forward to the uh, process ahead. <laughs> um, as you know, the upgrade to uh, 9.7, which is the IGT platform, is a significant upgrade to our core gaming system. Uh, the issue that we're facing at the moment is that it's going to require significant internal resources, external consultants, and expenditures. Um, we're trying to preserve all of our resources. Uh, as you know, they're extremely limited at this time. And the current implementation schedule would require us to divert resources from other areas uh, to this project. Uh, I just want to be clear, we remain committed to getting Play My Way up and running. And Actually, the 9.7 platform is something that our team is extremely excited about and is eager to implement. So it's, it's not that we're, I think we're gonna to continue to move forward. It's just really a question of allocation of resources. Uh, Mark and I spoke yesterday about the request to delay for another year. Uh, none of us anticipate that it's actually going to be a full year. I think our thought is we would try to pick this up as soon as uh, as soon as we return to some semblance of normalcy, whatever that, that may look like. Uh, I just think from a timing perspective, uh, as much as we'd all love to know when that sense of normalcy will return, uh, we don't have that uh, knowledge yet. So. Um, Questions, commissioners? Commissioner Cameron. Yeah, question, uh, Jackie. And, and this is certainly just a hypothetical. I understand that we have no idea, but say by this summer, there was some semblance, semblance of normalcy. How long would it take your team to then um, start and complete the work to finish um, this project? 
uh, my understanding is it's six to seven months out. Okay, so that would be uh, maybe a six month delay as opposed to a year de delay. That's exactly right. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, uh, let me, I, I don't have questions. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with the matter and I think it's clearly outlined here. I am um, inclined to grant the, the request uh, and point out a couple of things that, uh, that I think bear into, into, into this. Um, although it might be uh, tempting to, to say, um, you know, how come MGM is moving forward with the upgrade, which was, which was the, uh, a precondition of the deployment of, of Play My Way, this upgrade into the system of IGT. Um, I think we have to recognize that uh, each licensee is operating under different uh, mm -hmm. contexts. Uh, they have chosen a number of different things when it came to business practices and preservation of cash as they are uh, navigating these uh, these difficult times. Uh, uh, and you know, and I don't think that that, that it would be a fair um, a fair comparison. Um, I have also I would also note that uh, since we last granted this uh, request, the restriction the the conditions on. Um, uh, on the operations on, on Ancor and, and MGM for that matter, um, have only gotten more restrictive. Um, there has been, um, you know, less in, in terms of operation of, um, of hours, hours of operations and as well as um, occupancy limits that have been um, uh, um, limited in more, in more than, than, than before. Uh, and I would also uh, point out um, that uh, a number of other uh, costs have remained fixed for, for the licensees. Um, they have kept their uh, commitments and payments of hosts and surrounding community agreements. Um, uh, regulatory costs in the case of Ancor, uh, the independent monitor, uh, and, and many other uh, things that happen that their interest payments at, at a corporate level as well as, uh, as the resources that, um, uh, that, that Jackie only outlined. So um, although it, it's not um, uh, you know, um, ideal, I suppose, again, I'm, I'm inclined, given all the context in which they are operating, um, uh, I'm, 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 I'm inclined to, to grant this request and hope, as Commissioner Cameron is perhaps suggesting, that if things get uh, better in the short horizon, the business process itself that we would be taking deference to would get them to do an upgrade perhaps um, uh, earlier than, than they are now anticipating and develop uh, the Play My Way tool of which it's only a subset. Thank you, that's a really important summary. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, did you want to chime in? No, just to reiterate, uh, I, I'm in agreement with what everyone else has said, which is that given the current financial climate for the business, I, I think it's reasonable to grant the request so that they can move forward as they need to mm -hmm. in the short term and then address it when they can be in a position to address it, hopefully, to Commissioner Cameron's point, expeditiously so it's not actually that September date, assuming all things go well. Perhaps I could just add then a little strengthener. If we're going to, we need you need a vote from us today, correct, uh, Director Dean? Uh, yes, I do. I do. So per perhaps um, we could think about maybe um, <clears throat> first off to preface this is an extremely important tool for our, our the players at the casinos. I don't think anyone disagrees with that, and I and I do um, thank you, uh, Jackie, for indicating that it is a priority for. For encore, um, so that's a given. We also, you know, we respect the exact issues that you're raising, and I think Commissioner Zinnika summarized, you know, all your full commitment on all your other obligations. But it might be helpful because just to keep everyone accountable, um, perhaps um, when things do start to shift, as Commissioner Cameron suggested, that maybe we have an interim report on the work has begun. And, uh, and, and find and, and to, to make sure that somehow we don't find ourselves again a year later um, with work having been delayed 
Um, there may be another reason, but maybe we just get an interim report. Does that make sense of some sort? And maybe Commissioner O'Brien and others can think about how we weave that into any kind of a motion. Um, <clears throat> that way, you know, I think Commissioner Cameron's pointing out it could actually be, maybe be a start of the year next year um, if the players would have access to that important tool. You know, uh, Chair, to, to that end, um, there is a potentially a silver lining in the fact that uh, MGM is moving forward, and that is that uh, we will likely get some lessons uh, learned out of that effort as it continues. Excellent point. And, um, and we might be able to you know, work out those kinks along with MGM as well as we, as we move forward. In other words, I don't think that our effort here for the implementation of Play My Way um, is significantly diminished by granting this request. I think the, the, uh, we will benefit from, from, from their efforts as well. Excellent. Any further questions for Jackie or comments or, or just, questions? Just a comment that I, um, I always appreciate uh, Commissioner Zuniga's uh, fiscal clarity, bringing that to a matter. And I do really like the idea of um, knowing whether, rather than waiting until, um, say, another year, we get an interim report. And that would be certainly after we get back to some kind of a, some kind of a, I won't use the word steady state, but uh, some kind of a normalcy with, um, with this being under control. So uh, I think both, both the clarity and the suggestion of an interim report are good ideas. Yeah, yeah uh, this, I, I um, absolutely support that. Um, as Jackie mentioned, we had a discussion yesterday um, that I thought was good. Um, we, we are moving forward. This project has been moving forward steadily over, for quite some time and in, in good faith. Um, we want to continue that path. Um, and I think that a, a degree of accountability to assure that it continues to move on for all parties involved, including the Gaming Commission, to assure that it's moving forward um, at a pace that makes sense and considers the current environment is is great. So um, that uh, that that sounds appropriate to me as well. Excellent. Before we move on any motion, I just want to make sure, Katrina, did you right. want to get in? Do you have anything that would help us on this matter? Um, I would suggest, you know, obviously taking everything that's been said. Um, they're all very important factors and there are a lot of influences that are going on right now. My one thought that maybe we could possibly think as a recommendation, since the project wasn't deemed to be implemented until September of this year, would we consider maybe doing a six month extension, which also gives us that midpoint review a status update and we could revisit at that time if they do need the additional six months. Um, that was something that Mark and I had discussed. I think it shows, um, at least in my humble opinion, it would demonstrate the commitment to ensuring that Play My Way stays a priority, but it also helps flatten the field a little bit with accountability if we added or possibly considered doing the six month extension and then revisit at that time, should things not have gone as anticipated doing the full year. Thank you. Okay, so um, we've heard now from our team and we've heard from uh, Jackie. Further discussion from the commission. Mark, are you going to turn it as the yellow square lit up? No? Uh, Commissioner Zuniga. I, you know, I appreciate Katrina's comments, but I'm I'm, I'm still equally inclined uh, as as I was the, a few minutes ago on granting the request and and um, as as stated, and um, you know, determining as we as we go along and learn more about uh, hopefully conditions improving, um, as you suggested, uh, Chair, to get a, a report as to you know where where we might end up. Um, so. I appreciate uh, the suggestion, but I'm comfortable with the request as, as originally stated. Commissioners, are we set then uh, to, for a motion or is there, are there further questions? Commissioner Zuniga? Yes, I'm 
Commissioner O'Brien, do you want to take a stab at a motion? Uh, I would. I just look for clarity in terms of when you're talking about an interim report, you're talking about six months out from September 1 of 21. Are you looking at six months from this date? When you think you want some sort of interim report from um, the licensee on whether they need the year or not, what are you looking at timing wise? Well, I think the, the I have to say that I was thinking of that magic point of you know, some kind of a semblance of normalcy, which we can't really articulate, and it's not really right. one you want to go into a motion either. Um, so, how do we how do we navigate this, folks? Commissioner, well, rather than give a date, could we um, could we just be part of the part of the motion? Could be that when um, and, you know, when the licensee will know when they're back uh, to some kind of, uh, you know, numbers that make sense from a business operation standpoint. And of course, that'll all be based on what, what the state um, allows them to do with health and safety protocols. So I, I don't think we, I, I think we do, can just say we would look forward to a, um, an interim update, um, you know, uh, when operations are, um, uh, back to some kind of um, normalcy, and 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 we would anticipate. I mean, in my mind, that hopefully that would be within six months, but oh, I don't think uh, it's. I don't think it's. You can put a number on that. I just think for clarity, though, in terms of us knowing and the motion, and then them knowing when they're back. I'm I'm wondering if what we do is do the extension till September one of twenty two, with the understanding that by that on or before September 1 of 21, that we will hear from them on you know, their anticipation in terms of are they gonna need the year. Um, mm -hmm. you, you could key it to whether or not it's been rolled back or move forward to you know, phase four of the governor's rule. I think that's just too fluid. I, my preference would be to give a hard date. So what I'm proposing is that we do the extension out to September 1 of 22, that on or before September 1 of this year, we get a report from the licensee as to whether or not that year is still necessary. If I'll that's go on with that. Like which, that. Is, which is what, about eight months out? Is that about what we're thinking? About eight months out from here. Okay, that makes sense. That's a long enough period of time that hopefully there'll be some um, some change in circumstance. And if not, oh. then, then we'll, we'll hear about that, right? And so I think I like September or October, but September works for me. That's aligned with where we would have had the the, um, the team in place. So uh, an interim report uh, that uh, Director Vanderlyn and the, the process. Uh, Karen, are you all set with that idea? Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, then Madam Chair, I would move that the commission approve the request of Encore Boston Harbor to delay implementation of the Play My Way management system from the current date of September 1, 2020 to September 1 of 2021. Uh, further, that the licensee report back to the commission prior, on or before September 1 of 2020 as to the status of the implementation. I, I think you just, oh, the years have to years be one off. So, so we're September talking 21, 21 and 22. Yeah. Right, so it'd be extended to implementation date of no later than September 1 of 22. Uh, and further that they report back no later than September 1 of 2021 as to the status of the implementation. Second. Any further discussion on this? I'll take the vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Sunica. Aye. I vote yes. So that's 4 0. And, and uh, to Jackie, we wish uh, Encore. Uh, a lot of luck in all, all um, operations, but of course, we look forward to this report in September. Thank you very much. Rick. Great, thank you, and happy Happy New Year. Thank you. All right, okay, then I think we can move on to item B, uh, Mark. Um, this is on your Game Sense quarterly update, which we always look forward to. Thank you, and we have guests. Yes, we do. Um, I'm pleased to uh, bring forward the, the GameSense quarter, quarterly report. Um, the, the GameSense team has worked really hard to pull together, I think, a, a fantastic um, presentation for you. Uh, um, I'll just 
point out uh, Teresa Fiore, who's the program manager and really provides a lot of support to the, the GameSense program. Um, we also have Marlene Warner, who is the executive director of the Mass Council on Gaming and Health. Um, Chelsea Turner, who is their director of responsible gaming. Jody Neely, who is a liaison, a VSE resource liaison. And Lynn Ho, who is a senior GameSense advisor, will also be contributing to this. So given the number of people that we have, I don't really feel like I need to, to say too much more. And I'm just going to turn it over to them to, to let them uh, drive the presentation. And I'm more than happy to chime in throughout and answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Good morning. Good morning, uh, and thank you, Mark. Uh, good afternoon, actually, commissioners. Oh, good uh, afternoon, Chelsea. <laughs> I know, and other FGC staff and other guests. Uh, we really are grateful for the opportunity to present uh, before you this afternoon, so thank you very much for your time. Um, we wanted to start off by talking about a topic that is uh, very common. Uh, and to you all, uh, which is safety. Um, and so just like the casinos are doing, uh, safety is the number one, um, uh, is paramount at the forefront of everything we do at the Game Sense Centers right now. Um, obviously, uh, we comply with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health guidelines, the casinos guidelines, and um, the MGC's guidelines, as well as our own. So wearing masks is mandatory, of course, uh, social distancing, um, is strictly enforced, hand washing, frequent hand washing is encouraged, um, cleaning, vigilant cleaning, um, the casinos are fantastic about uh, cleaning the centers and we also uh, regularly clean them ourselves, cleaning all of our equipment. Um, and then even we go as so far as to require our staff to, uh, to wash their clothes before they're allowed to return to work. So as you all know, they wear um, either a gray sweater or a green shirt and black pants and um, they must wash their clothes before they return to work. So that is at the forefront of every, everything we do right now. Um, it also means that the way that we interact with our patrons is different. And so we have to be safely distanced. So we are using technology more um, and our own creative ideas in order to do these interactions. Um, predominantly, we use the large monitors um, at the game centers to conduct fun educational quizzes. Um, and then we also use laminated flashcards um, if we're away from the center. So um, adhering to strict safely, safety protocols, but still um, finding creative ways to engage with patrons. Next slide. Um, before we talk about the numbers at the casinos, just wanted to give a, I know you guys are familiar probably with the definitions, but I still sometimes have to go back to remind myself what they mean. So just very quickly, when we talk about simple interactions, we're talking about things like uh, somebody asks you where the restroom is or how do I get to the bus stop? Um, so basically non-gaming related interactions. A demonstration is a two-way exchange between a, a GameSense staff member and a patron that involves um, some type of teaching tool such as a brochure or the monitor. Um, an exchange is a two-way communication about RG or PG which does not use a GameSense tool. Uh, casino related interactions are questions that we get about, you know, where do I go to pick up my free promotional item or um, can you exp tell me where the rewards, uh, where the re reward center is, those types of questions. Um, voluntary self exclusions, you uh, were all pioneers in um, implementing this program, so I know you're familiar with that. And then reinstatements is the process by which a patron um, can remove themselves from, from the list. Um, next slide. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the numbers um, basically over the last four months. So the first slide that we have in front of us right now is for Plain Ridge Park Casino. And if you look at that, the things that you're going to notice, and this is something you're going to notice across all three properties, is that in September, the numbers are uh, particularly at PPC and Encore, uh, especially high. And that's in large part because of RGEW, Responsible Gambling Education Week. Um, we are really fortunate to be able to work with PPC during that week to safely set up a table literally outside um, by the valet area, if you're, if you're familiar with the property. Um, and we actually had stanchions set up in front of the table so that we um, forced people to six feet, uh, dis to safely six feet distance. 
Um, so that's why you're going to see a, a spike at PPC, and I'll talk about EVH uh, when we get to that during September. And then you see relatively cons consistent numbers um, in October, November, and December. Um, one of the things we've talked a lot about is that at PPC, um, in many ways, they've seem to have, been, at least in, from our perspective, been impacted the least by the new restrictions. Um, it tends to be an earlier crowd at PPC. So, you know, most of our interactions were happening before 10 o'clock anyways. Obviously, now they're shutting down at 930. So the impact on PPC is a little bit less drastic than, for example, at Encore. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about with um, PPC is the VSE numbers are relatively steady, which is we're happy to see um, and consistent. Um, and so those are really, really important interactions that we have. Um, and then lastly, um, this isn't a surprise to you all, but this is a, a, a community that skews older compared to the other two casinos. Next slide. Um, now we're looking at MGM numbers, and uh, again, you see, so MGM actually for RG, RGEW um, probably struggled the most in part because we didn't have a great location um, to really safely conduct activities. So we were limited by what we could do, um, more so than at PPC and EVH. So you don't see the same spike during September at MGM. Interestingly, you see the numbers climb up in December, and that's in part because we had staff that were either uh, were on vacation and we were actually more fully staffed in December. And so just by having a, an, a, you know, one person come back, it can make a significant difference. And the particular person that was away is probably one of our more gregarious GSAs. So it was nice to see the impact that um, he could have. Um, in addition, if you look at the VSEs, it's kind of interesting that December and November were a little bit down, but again, um, not, insig not an insignificant amount of VSEs. Um, next slide. Uh, this is Encore's numbers. Um, again, you see that spike in September for RGEW, and during RGEW, um, Encore was kind enough to let us um, partner with them during a promotion. And so we basically just did a very quick one question exchange um, with folks as they were safely distanced in line to go up to get their promotional item. So that's why you see that huge spike in numbers um, at Encore during September. Um, October, you'll see still pretty high numbers. And the reason why you're going to then see the dip in November and December is because Encore is probably, in our opinion, for our, our interactions at the Game Sense Center, is the most impacted um, by the reduced hours and the re reduced capacity. Encore um, is a later crowd, it's a younger crowd, and so closing early really, really affects them and it impacts our numbers considerably. Um, VSE, rule, VSE numbers um, are also significant here. Um, and you'll notice that in September and October, there's asterisks, and um, if you look at the, uh, the little uh, explanation at the bottom, you'll notice that four of the VSCs in September and six of the VSEs in October occurred during the overnight shift. So that's between the hours of 1 a.m. and 9 a.m. So we were, um, we had implemented 24-7 uh, hours at Encore uh, prior to the hours being reduced. And um, we found immediately um, an impact, particularly in the area of VSEs. Um, you know, that's 10 VSEs that happened in the overnight shift in just two months. So a significant amount of VSC is happening then. Um, and so, you know, we, we're hopeful the casinos will be back 24 seven at some point in the future too, because we actually know that that's a, a really critical time where we can reach people. Um, next slide. So in summary, um, you know, year over year, our interaction numbers are obviously down um, and that's understandable. Um, we're keeping safety uh, again at the forefront of every, everything that we do. There are fewer ways for us to interact with patrons. You know, we're no longer conducting 60-sided 60 60-sided 60 uh, dice games or um, spinning, you know, spinning a wheel. Um, so, you know, we're really limited in those ways. Um, but, but we are still having a significant number of interactions. 
also patrons are just like less likely to engage anyways. I think all of us are a little bit more guarded when we're out in public and that's natural. And so, you know, it's, it's hard to catch somebody's eye even when you can use your mouth. Um, but when you can just use it, we, we talk about smiling with our eyes, it's, it's even harder. Um, and then of course the capacity is limited, the hours are reduced. And then the, we've talked about this in the past, the traffic patterns um, at the three casinos have changed. Um, they are better for us now at PPC. Um, at MGM, it's still a bit of a challenge. Um, regarding staffing, um, just like all other places uh, across the Commonwealth, we've been impacted by reductions as well. We went from a staff of 23 game sense uh, advisors to 17, and we currently still have one on furlough. Um, this is a, approximately a 25% reduction in staffing hours overall compared to last year. So obviously with 25% less staff, we're gonna have less interactions. Um, but highlights, I mean, I, there's plenty of things, of good things to talk about. Um, you know, the number of VSEs we were able to get is still, cons still significant, um, totaling close to 40 uh, over the last few months. Um, we're developing new ways to interact, integrate technology. We've tried digitized quizzes and we're gonna be doing hopefully more of that during PGM. Um, we, and I'll talk about remote VSEs uh, in, a, in a couple slides from now, but um, have implemented remote VSEs uh, using the monitors, I touched on that already. And then just being more creative. So on, this, on the left uh, here, you'll see a picture of Aisha, who's one of our GSEs at MGM. Uh, wearing a Halloween mask, um, which was just kind of a nice, fun, lighthearted thing to do. Our GSAs do things like this all the time, naturally, on their own. You know, we have GSAs that wear their, for, for example, their favorite sports team. And the, we found that the, the masks can actually lead to, to fun conversations. So, um, again, just being very creative. Next slide. If I can just chime in real quick. Uh, uh, Chelsea, you talked about uh, changing traffic patterns. and um, with uh, the new protocols as patrons are coming and going, the casinos have, have, have changed how patrons are coming and going off of the casino floor. Um, and as careful as we were to plan where games and info centers um, are at the casinos um, to assure that we have high traffic areas, when they change the entrances and exits related to, to COVID, um, that definitely impacted those traffic patterns. So. Um, we've worked with the casinos with, and, you know, ultimately this will go back to the, the way it was, but it, it certainly impacted the traffic that was coming by the centers for, um, for this time. Thanks. Thanks Mark. Sorry. No, that's, that's great. Thank you. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about are, um, is something new and exciting that we're, uh, eager to share with you all today. Uh, we now have the ability to conduct remote voluntary self exclusions. Um, in large part, thanks to Teresa and to Ray Fluet, um, we've developed a safe and secure way to uh, conduct VSEs basically using like a Zoom style meeting um, and secure technology. And this is fantastic uh, for a number of reasons, including safety. Not everybody is comfortable with face-to-face -face conversations, even with distancing and masks. So you no, no longer need to be in person. Um, logistically, you know, some people have transportation barriers. So we eliminate that barrier. Um, connection, the personal connection when you conduct a VSU remains a, a priority. Um, and it's essential that participants feel supported and that they're provided a warm handoff. So um, it's, it's not as, it's not this, quite at the same as being in person, but I think it's the next best thing. Um, and then comfort, you know, um, hearing uh, the, the sort of the soothing voice of a GSA on the phone seeing them smile, knowing that they're gonna be okay, and also not having to walk back into a casino if they don't want to, if that's the place that's causing them harm is important. And lastly, just being there um, for them when they need to be. So our hope is that when the casinos are back up and running 24 seven, that we'll be offering remote VSEs 24 seven. So even if our game sense centers are shutting down at one o'clock at MGM and at PPC, there'll be a phone number up where they can call to get a VSE and we can engage in that process at whatever time of day um, that they'd like at any day of the year. So uh, really, really cool stuff. And again, uh, huge kudos to Teresa and Ray for their efforts on this. 
Next slide. Um, uh, at this point in time, I'd like to turn it over to Jody Neely, who's our outreach and recovery uh, liaison. Um, she's the person behind the scenes um, that after somebody goes through a VSC is going to sort of follow up with them, um, see about what, what resources that they might be interested in, um, engage in telephone recovery support if um, they're interested. I'll let her um, tell you a little bit more about that, but just a little bit about her quickly. She has a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and is a certified uh, addiction specialist as well. Um, and she's a person in long-term recovery. She's, again, somebody behind the scenes, but in many ways, um, you know, part of that, that strong skeleton uh, that keeps that VSE uh, program uh, up and running and um, is such a valuable uh, resource for folks that are struggling with their gambling. So, Jody. We're going we're gonna to have the word you're muted in the dictionary soon. Uh, thank you all uh, for letting me to present here. Uh, this, is all, this is just sort of a job description of what I do. Um, you know, you can read it. It's, uh, it's really been an interesting expansion of, the, of my role at the council, and um, it has worked very well, the, this wonderful... Um, partnership I have with, uh, with everybody who works at the council, with the Game Sense Advisors, with Chelsea, uh, just great communication and really good referrals from the Game Sense folks who are out there on the front lines. And it has really been an honor for me to use my experience, such as it was, to help others. So um, we'll move on to the next slide because you don't need to look at my job description. There I am. I asked Chelsea to change the slide from my professional shot because this is really who I am. Uh, that's a picture of me at a, when you could go to recovery events in person. I was out in Springfield. That was probably September 2019. And uh, I do miss being out on the road, but as we've said in this past meeting, we'll get there eventually. So uh, for VSE follow-ups, um, whenever the Game Sense Advisors do a voluntary self-exclusion, they ask if the person doing it would like to have a, a one week or so follow up. And they usually mention <clears throat> my name and tell them a little bit about me. And then I get the form. And usually within a week or so, I do reach out for the first time. Um, <clears throat> the uh, protocols for me are that if I get, sometimes people just give their phone number, sometimes they just give their email, sometimes they give both. If they give just their phone, I will try up to 10 times I space it out. Believe me, I don't try like three times a week. I really space it out. I don't want to be stalking anybody, give people time. Uh, up to 10 times, I will try to contact a person. And by email, I really only do it about four times. If all I have is an email from them, because enough is enough. Uh, they, they, they'll get through. If they don't get the first one, they'll get the second one. And then if I give both, I do both. I call leave a voicemail, and then I send an email. So you can see from the numbers, uh, uh, since July 1st, I've had 36 people that have requested follow-ups. I've connected voice-wise voice, voice -wise by phone, or you know sometimes it's a text first, then it's a phone with 24 of them. And um, so that's 31, so seven I haven't, and then five are in progress. So patience and persistence pay off. Uh, sometimes I literally get somebody on the ninth call. Literally, they pick up. Uh, so, you know, I do my thing. And it, as I say, a pleasure to do that. And then this telephone recovery support thing, this has been a great program. We've never had this before. Usually if someone called the helpline or if they wanted a one-week follow-up, we would do that. But we didn't have sort of a understanding or their permission to keep following up. So the TRS program, Telephone Recovery Support, is basically me saying to someone, hey, uh, you know, we've had a good conversation. I've sent you some resources. Would you like me to check in with you, you know, once a week for up to 10 weeks? And if so, let's pick a time. So on Wednesdays at 10 a.m., I call Mary and I say, Mary, how was your week? And she said, oh, I'm doing really well. And I said, did you get to the GA meeting I told you about in Springfield? Oh, oh by the way, here's another one. I'll send you the information about another Zoom meeting that happened, uh, or, or I get no. I you know I went out and gambled today. Um, sometimes I go to casinos, you know, 
whether they be a seat or not. And I said, well, let's talk about that. What were you thinking? And it's just a conversation, you know. I, so much about my work and about recovery in general is having the conversation in the way that people feel comfortable having the conversation, whatever pathway they're at. Um, and if they, if, if they think they're going to go back to the casino after the VSC, that's, you know, that's fine. We talk about the, the in-between time. And, um, you know, there have been many people I've connected with who I've developed relationships with. And sometimes we'll say, oh, you know, when we get to go to GA meetings in person, maybe I'll see you. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. I'm known as Jody N out there. Feel free to let me know who you are. And it's relationships, right? I mean, I really think it's not just credibility and having conversations, it's relationship building, which is what the Game Sense advisors do so well with the folks that they meet, and then they get to pass that initial relationship off to me, and I, um, I can take it as far as I can take it. You know, sometimes people go through the whole 10 weeks of phone calls, sometimes after five or six, they're saying, you know, we're great, I'm great, and I'm like, they always call me, you know, call me, text me, whatever, I'm here for you. So it's that, it's that kind of, um, it's that kind of relationship with people. And, uh, you know, success story, magic moments. Well, you know, there, there's been a lot. There's been one woman who I knew did a VSC with Amy. Uh, she and I went through 10 conversations. She actually, she called me, wished me happy, Merry Christmas. This was after the program, the official TRS was done. She called me again in New Year's and she goes, it's been six months since I had my last bet. And I'm like, way to go, you know. Um, and uh, it's the magic, really, uh, sort of the whole thing is magic when you talk to somebody who, who maybe they didn't get something. You know, some of the things I find the most is I'll say something. And, you know, the commissioner, if you've seen me speak before, it's really just whatever comes to mind, right? So I'm talking to somebody on the phone and one guy, and I said, do you ever journal things? Oh, he goes, I hate writing stuff down. Or I hate writing stuff down. So in my head, for the first time ever, I said, well, why don't you record your thoughts and feelings on your phone? And he's like, oh that's a great idea. I hate to write, well, I'll do it on the phone. And you know, and that just popped into my head. I might not even remember it again for the next person, just to sort of in the moment. And, uh, but sometimes when you explain gambling, how it's different from substance use, you see, literally, I see the light bulbs go off. And, you know, whether they've stopped gambling for the rest of their life, or they're just taking a break, whatever information we can exchange with each other, you know, I really feel like it's been helpful. So I would say that both these programs, the follow-ups and the TRS, have been um, been successful. So I'm handing it back to Chelsea. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jody. Um, I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about some of our communications highlights. A lot has been happening. Um, we have a fantastic collaboration with the MGC team on this. Um, including uh, Teresa and Austin, and I know there's uh, the extension to uh, KHJ as well. Um, but we have uh, very robust social media efforts, which have, of course include Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And we push RGPG messages, um, public health messages, game studs tips out through both the Game Sense Massachusetts platform as well as the Mass Council on Gaming and Health platform. Um, you know, over the last four months, we saw you know, a reach of 30,000 plus folks um, just from the MACGH platform. So pretty impressive numbers there. Um, on the right, you're gonna see, this is a one of, it's a picture of one of our new pull-up banners. We have uh, two pull-up banners that we're allowed to put out at PPC. Uh, usually one is uh, stationed by the entrance way and the valet area and the other ones by the Game Sense Center. These pull-up banners are taller than me. Well, that, I guess that doesn't say much because I'm kind of short, uh, <laughs> but they're about seven feet tall or so. Um, they very much pop. Um, they're simple. We keep it clean and simple. And it's a way to try to engage, to, to get somebody to start a conversation with us. So in this particular example, you know, I don't know how this game works. No problem. We do. Let's talk at the Game Sense Info Center. You know, we're we're encouraging folks to talk to us about their gaming behavior. You know, do they understand? Uh, do they understand what they're doing when they bet on the roulette table or play blackjack? So, um, we, you know, it's a, it's a way to again get them to engage. So, um, so we thank both PPC and MGM for for letting us do that. Um, also, we distributed our GameSense newsletters um, and announced GameSense Champion awardees. 
And I just wanted to quickly mention their names. Um, these are folks that are casino employees that our GameSense staff has recognized as going above and beyond when it comes to responsible gaming. So at PPC, we, um, we recognize Nuala Dearden, Joanne Smith, and Lisa Duen Guamala. At MGM, we recognize Christopher Benoit. And at EBH, we recognized Richie Mendoza, Lag Hoang Mujain, and Francisco Chacon. And all of them received a gift card and a, a kind note from uh, the Game Sense Commission um, thanking them for going above and beyond. Um, this is a fun way for us to, um, to acknowledge folks that are uh, connecting folks uh, to the Game Sense Center um, when they might be in distress. Um, so please thank thanks to all of them. Um, and then lastly, uh, pretty recently, actually early December, we participated in a local broadcasting se session um, in central Massachusetts uh, with a senior population. Um, and it's estimated that this broadcasted presentation will be picked up by 20 other local TV stations um, and will literally reach thousands of people across the Commonwealth. So we're excited about that. We also um, uh, filmed two general PSAs and are about to get those and are looking forward to, uh, to getting those out um, into the community as well. Next slide. So this is one of two um, gifts, I guess. I'm, I'm not the most uh, social media conscious. Facebook is about all I can handle. But these are examples. This is an example of a gift that we put out on social media that connects sort of the holidays to responsible gaming. This first one reminds folks that as they set a budget when it comes to their holiday spend that they also do that with game gambling. This is Aisha from MGM. And then the second one is David from Encore. And it reminds folks, it reminds adults not to gift lottery tickets to kids. Um, this is part of a larger campaign that I'll get to in a second. Um, so just a cute, clever way to um, do something fun on social media, tying in the holidays and tying in our, our RG tips. Um, originally, we wanted to do videos where the Game Sense Advisors could actually talk, but there wasn't really a great, easy way for us to do that with them wearing masks. And um, even though we're in a pandemic, masks on social media don't, doesn't look, it's not the best. So, um, so we thought this was a nice sort of compromise. Uh, next slide. So some additional communication uh, highlights. Um, the, the two videos that you just saw is particularly the lottery one. Um, the National Council on Problem Gambling and the McGill's uh, Center for Youth Gambling Problems and High-Risk Behaviors in Montreal um, every year launch a national, actually international, because it's Canada and the United States, campaign um, with gaming entities and responsible gambling entities uh, really to remind folks not to put lottery tickets in kids' stockings. And so um, the council's been a longtime partner with them on, that, on those efforts, and that's a fun way for us to get involved. Um, secondly, we partnered with PPC, and, you know, again, want to thank them. Uh, on, a, on a holiday toy drive, you see a picture on the right of, um, you know, literally hundreds of toys that we collected uh, for Toys for Tots, so that was fun. And then lastly, um, we continue to partnership partner with BCLC, um, and that has a lot of benefits, which you'll see in a, in a couple seconds. Next slide. Um, here's some of the responsible gaming holiday messaging that we did that was out on social media, so you can look through that later, but I just wanted to sort of point out the partnership with BCLC. You see that scratch and win tickets aren't for kids right on the top. That came from them. Um, so it's nice that we're able to share and exchange uh, information um, and that makes our resources go further, certainly. All right, before we go to the next two, um, two slides, they're really videos, um, and they're videos that, um, that BCLC shared with us uh, that, talk, that educate folks about randomness. Um, they're very different, but they're sort of the same message. Um, I'll let you decide which one you like best. Uh, I definitely have a favorite, but I think they're both, both very cute and very clever. So. And, um, and just to be clear, BCLC is the British Columbia Lottery Corporation, who we uh, have a partnership with, have had a partnership with since 2015 um, on the GameSense uh, program. So. All right. 
There you go. So that was the first one. Commissioner Cameron, I, I, as a golfer, I know you probably like that one a lot. I think it's very, very cute and fun. So I uh, and we have one. I love that one. I just, I try not to break my clubs though. <laughs> uh, all right. And then the second um, video. How'd that happen to you, have you, Commissioner Cameron? <laughs> Randomness. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I, I love the second one too, probably because I'm a mom and maybe that one speaks to me, but um, I think they're both great ways to sort of remind folks that there's always an element of chance when you gamble. And so, you know, Game Sense is really about, um, as you all know, um, making sure that the, the folks in the middle uh, don't get into the problem area. And so we try to connect with them uh, using humor and, and different, different strategies and different techniques um, to relate to them. And I think both of these videos are excellent examples of that. All right, next slide. All right, at this point in time, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Lynn Ho, who is a senior GSA at Encore Boston Har Harbor. And he is a fantastic asset to our GameSense team. He is fluent in Vietnamese. Um, he has a background in gaming. Uh, he's an expert in slot machines in particular. Um, and he's part of our outreach team as well. Um, he loves talking to older adults um, and folks uh, that are Vietnamese or in the Asian community. Um, he does just an, a fantastic job and some of the relationship he's, he has been able to uh, build um, are, 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 are really remarkable. And we're looking forward to, as everybody else is, when the pandemic is over and actually being able to do some of our presentations in person. But, in the meantime, again, we're we're using Zoom and being creative, and I'm going to let turn it over to Lynn and let you, let him tell you about some of his successes. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners. It's nice to see you again today. Um, since the last time we see, and Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, this past year has been a challenge year for all of us uh, with the pandemic and the closure of the casino due to the pandemic. Um, during this difficult time, our Game Sense team adjusted very well by working from home and learning new skills. Uh, we learned how to develop presentations uh, through PowerPoints and also on subjects such as video gaming and sport betting uh, and so many more. And thanks to our leaderships that guide us to uh, where we are. Uh, since then, our Game Sense uh, advisor have not missed a beat since the casino reopening. Uh, and, um, and our whole team is taking safety very, very seriously, and we follow all the safety guidelines and protocols uh, that put in place. And uh, thank you to Encore uh, our staff for helping us clean up the set, uh, the the game center, center on the, the routine uh, um, the routine trips. Uh, we learn how to interact with guests uh, safely, and uh, still have that personal approach uh, when we uh, interact with them. Uh, and our, G our game sense advisor have uh, been great, great at it. Um, so in the past three months, uh, uh, you know, in September, October, and November, uh, we conducted four new hire trainings at Encore. And we want to thank the Encore uh, team for helping us to setting up uh, these trainings. And uh, also at PBC, uh, we conducted one training, and thanks, thanks to PBC staff for setting up that training. 
uh, myself, I also conducted uh, one designated agent uh, training during the month of October. As the uh, GameSense 2.0 uh, uh, kicked off um, the past year, uh, I am fortunate enough to have an important role in outreach uh, to the community surrounding uh, uh, Encore, especially in the Asian communities, uh, where you know we need to uh, uh, um, be more present uh, in these communities. Uh, my colleague, Amy Cabrera, uh, you guys all know her, uh, she's switching out to the seniors uh, communities, and Charlie Odell, uh, Odell is switching out to the veteran communities, and not just these three uh, important communities, but also all at-risk communities that are, we are reaching out to, uh, uh, either through phone, emails, or in-person. In-person is impossible now because due to the uh, uh, COVID. Uh, um, it is um, more challenging uh, to reach out uh, to organization during this time uh, because there's a lot of uh, organization that are still closed or they're not allowing people to be at the centers. Uh, but we managed to innovate ways to reach out to these folks uh, to offer them that uh, you know, uh, uh, the service that we have available for them um, and also offer them the uh, online presentation which we, we, we have and we uh, develop uh, we have presentations that are uh, translated into Vietnamese, Chinese, uh, and this is a, the, the great, the great uh, uh, tool for, for folks to, who does not uh, speak the, the, the English language to, to be involved. So um, uh, I have reached out to many new organizations during these times and also reconnecting to the one that we previously had great, a great relationship with in the past. And uh, the feedback has been very, very positive. Uh, uh, a lot of them are interested in having us uh, to, uh, to bring the GameSense meshes to, to, uh, to their uh, centers. Um, and because of the, the technology, there's a lot of members in their organization that have difficulty of using technologies. Uh, um, they, they, they want us to come back in person when allowed to, uh, to, to do so. And many expresses, you know, they want us, uh, our GameSense to be part of their communities, part of their organizations. And uh, uh, I've been doing a lot of outreach uh, uh, through, uh, through since I've been uh, with GameSense, and it's the relationship building that uh, Jody was touching on earlier. That you know we we build relationship. Uh, uh, they understand who we are. They they you know what are we here to do for them, and what we have to offer for them. And it's I, I find it to be very rewarding when I I talk to uh, uh, people f around the communities and they they know who GameSense are. You know, they, they know that uh, the, the works that we do in the community and also inside the casinos. Uh, and we are here to help people and to, to, to have that uh, option that, you know, if whenever they need the resources, we can connect them to these resources that uh, is available for them. Um, I did a few presentations uh, online through Zoom. Uh, it's a new uh, thing now. So uh, I, I did a, a presentation to a group of Vietnamese older adults uh, at the Worcester Senior Centers. Um, in October, and they are very, very happy to see us, uh, you know, reaching out to them uh, in this time because you know what, uh, this is the only thing that they can see us, you know, through uh, uh, through meetings like this. And uh, I have done presentation in the past uh, uh, at the centers um, in person before uh, COVID, um, but now it's uh, we need to adjust to do it online, and uh, you know, uh, uh, the relationship that we have during the past. Uh, uh, past years with them, uh, they very appreciate that you know we are still in touch with them, call them and, and ask them what we can offer for them you know what can we do and they're very uh, much appreciate that the, you know, the, the, the outreach that we're doing to uh, in the communities and I also did a, a, a zoom presentation to a group of uh, our staff at the uh, greater Boston Chinese uh, Golden Age Center in Chinatown. Uh, this organization, we have great, great relationship with, uh, you know, for, for many years now. And, uh, you know, to explain that, you know, we are here, we are available for, 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 for you, uh, for their organizations. Um, and they are very delighted, you know, that we are reaching out to them during these difficult times. And uh, they would want us to be back in the center in person when, uh, when uh, uh, times allow or the safety protocols allow. And that is the, the, the thing that we, we, we uh, have built. We built a lot of relationship uh, with the previous uh, organization and also the new ones. Uh, for example, the new ones that you know, we, uh, I have reached out to uh, is um, 
the Asian American Civic Association in China also. And I have scheduled two presentations next month with a group of students. Uh, they are uh, 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 English as second language students, uh, a group of six, uh, 50 to 60 students that will be involved in this. And some of the students are working at Encore. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for, uh, uh, for me to bring the Game Sense uh, brand and the message uh, into this, uh, this uh, uh, group of folks there. Uh, and, uh, you know, I find it to be very, very rewarding uh, every time I'm doing it because, uh, you know, um, the more message we get out there in the communities, uh, the better it is to prepare the folks that if they decide to come to the casino, they are well aware that, you know, uh, who we are in the casino and, and where to look for us. And not just organization that we know in the past, but, you know, uh, also the new one that we are developing uh, right now. Uh, and uh, a lot of them are interested in the program that we are, are providing to them. Uh, also, um, you know, uh, uh, Charlie uh, did two presentations uh, with Mass Hire uh, in his uh, uh, area there. And also Amy just did a great presentation at Sutton Senior Center uh, on a local access TV that's available for, uh, to use by 120 towns. And, uh, you know, I, I saw that presentation that she did and she, she did a phenomenal job on that. Um, so not, not just we offering people present a game sense presentation, but I also involving in organization that I reach out to inviting me to join into their, uh, their meetings, their online meetings or their webinar. Uh, so this way I have to, I can learn more about the people in the communities and also the communities, uh, uh, what they've been through and what they're talking about, you know, so that way we have a better idea of who, who we reaching out to. Uh, just for example of that is, I, you know, I joined on a Zoom uh, with a Vietnamese family event in Dorchester and uh, to meet the people in the community, uh, to hear about their stories, uh, how they deal with the, uh, the, the pandemic, and also some of the people bring up the story about gambling habits. So this is the kind of uh, involvement that we, uh, we are involved in, uh, not just offering our, our game sense presentation, but also uh, offering ourselves, uh, our time, uh, to be involved in in, in the, uh, the in their communities, and uh, uh, I you know I'm very uh, fortunate to work with a group of uh, great great peoples, and the leadership work that we have uh, in place is uh, have been uh, uh, nothing but phenomenal. Um, it is very rewarding for me to see people in the communities know about the Game Sense brand, and the message of the Game Sense. And, and, and when uh, uh, when they go into the casino, they see the uh, the Game Sense advisor. Uh, they know that these advisors here are, are here to help them. And uh, to close this out is I remember when uh, Encore first opened, uh, um, I met Chair Judge Stein and also Commissioner Cameron on the gaming floor on that first day when they opened. And I remember this sentence that Judge Stein all, uh, say to me is, boy, I'm glad that you're the first person I see. And that really made me feel good because I know I'm doing some good work. And earlier when uh, Just Time said, oh, Game Sense uh, uh, subject is up, so I see this big smile on her face. So I, I really, really loved it. Loved it. So uh, thank you very much for your support. All right. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so this is, I'm Lynn Warner. I think everyone knows me. I think Lisa told me I, I've been around long enough. Nobody needs to introduce me. And I think she's right. <laughs> So anyway, um, I, I'm acutely aware of the fact that um, we are standing between you at lunch, so I just want to run through, through a few slides that we have um, about some upcoming things. Um, hopefully you all can hear me okay. I am doing this by video for my video but phone um, for my audio. Um, so we are really excited about a training that we've wor been working with Jackie and her team over at EDH on, which is uh, to do some in-depth training with um, her entire staff, and we're talking about doing a 30-minute training, uh, working with her staff member who was one of our Game Sense awardees, Richie Mendoza, and his team, their uh, training and professional development group there, on um, doing online learning modules. That's going to be a 30-minute piece, um, and it's going to follow up to a Game Sense 101 training that Teresa and, and Richie and Jeanette over there and, and our team have been working hard on and then having some additional modules, including one on resources for Asian communities. So that's something that they're gonna have. All, thousands of employees will be able to interact with that. And then they can always follow up with our Game Sense team for more information. So we're very excited about that. In addition to that, 
uh, Jackie has been great about offering us an hour with um, all the uh, host and marketing team that works directly with the Asian community and wanting to have an interactive, still virtual, but a live interactive training with them around, um, you know, what are some of the things that they see that are um, concerning or questions that they have, but also us being able to impart some of the, the Asian specific data that we have um, to their team and just have a dialogue about resources that are outside of the casino. And then what can even our um, inside the casino, what can our game fest do, teams do to help them? So I'm um, very excited about that. We're really hoping that that will launch in March for Costume Awareness Month, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a few moments and um, more on that as, as, we, um, as that unfolds. Next slide. So augmented reality, you've heard me say endlessly and you've heard uh, Commissioner Zuniga and uh, Mark talk about GameSense 2.0. This is certainly a part of GameSense 2.0. Um, so augmented reality is, is kind of a, is a, you know, a new project that we launched last year and it was kind of a test case for like, how can we take GameSense to a whole another kind of, you know, reality, essentially. Um, Augmented reality is the concept, and I don't know if, you know, I, I bought a chair for my daughter at Target, and I was able to take uh, through the app at Target and see if the chair looked right in her room, um, and you could put it in your space. So it's that idea. It's not virtual reality where you step into another reality, it's that you take a, something and you put into your reality. Um, I, we are... Um, we've kind of gone around and around in terms of what made the most sense and what looks best and we've been relying very heavily on our senior GSAs and our entire game sense team. I think we're on a really nice track. Um, what we're hoping to do is really explain how Sedge, one of the things we went to our game sense um, teams and said was what is hard to explain in a very um, short time period and how Sedge was by far and away what they explained. They said it's a hard concept People don't really get it, and they, but they want to. They want to understand, but they don't. It, but it's a hard thing to explain. So we're hoping that this AR app is going to help us. It's obviously a safe thing to do. We're just going to use the monitors that have been um, installed in the three centers, um, as well as our iPads, to be able to do that. And we hope that it'll really engage patrons in a new new way. And then the other neat thing is that if they're doing this on their own devices right on their smartphones they can take it home and they can continue to use it and they always are carrying it around with them versus a brochure which is hard sometimes to think that people are going to hold on to that or keep that in their back pocket um, and that probably the most exciting thing is that it's it's a constant learning tool it evolves as you use it further um, so it's really the more time you spend with it the more you'll learn so we really hope that um, come April in our next uh, Quarterly report will be able to give you more information about that, but we really think it's turning out nicely. Next slide, please. Um, so on the 28th, uh, your next public meeting, we're going to come in and talk to you about positive play. It's a concept you've all been hearing about for a while. It's a concept that's in the responsible gaming frame, the Massachusetts responsible gaming framework. Um, but it's something that we haven't directly connected to Massachusetts data. And uh, we've just completed a survey of 1,500 Massachusetts residents. It was an online survey um, using the positive play, that should say play, not pay, <laughs> positive play scale in the Problem Gambling Severity Index. And um, I think the, you're going to be quite um, interested in the results. I know I was. I think there's a lot of real implications for the next steps um, and directions that GameSense can take in terms of having this. I think one of the things that we realized is that game sense has made great strides, but we haven't personalized this to our specific players. One of the things BCLC did when they got this same data is that they were able to segment uh, messaging to, they had about, five, I think it was five to seven segments, um, and they were able to segment their players into these different groups and then really target their RG messaging and their marketing to that, those groups. We're hoping to do the same. So more on that from directly from the researchers that are going to come in um, uh, on the 28th. Uh, the low risk gambling guidelines, yet another thing that's come out of Canada. We keep trying to be innovative, but somehow we can never beat out our Canadian friends and we're so grateful to them for all their amazing work. The low risk gambling guidelines is an effort from a group that had some Americans and, and folks elsewhere 
involved, but led by the Canadian Center on Substance Use and Addiction around looking at just like drinking guidelines, and they also have guidelines around cannabis use, um, how they can advise the public on how to keep their risk low around gambling. So we will give you more guideline details on that and how we're rolling that out. And I honestly think, you know, Mark and I are talking a lot about how positive play and low-risk gambling guidelines go together. Um, but there's some really specific um, and I think useful um, guidelines on what do you tell the average player when they walk into the casino, how they might keep their gambling safe. Um, so again, more on that in the future. And the great news is that we have Massachusetts-specific data that was involved in the project to validate um, these results. And so Dr. Rachel Volberg and her team um, included magic in that. And then the last thing I just want to talk about is that certainly when we come back in April, we hope to have a lot to tell you about Problem Gambling Awareness Month. It's every March. Uh, this March will be um, the same. However, as Chelsea alluded to, we're really trying to um, keep things safe and socially distanced. So it'll be un it will be unlike other marches in the sense that we won't be tabling the back of a house and we won't be doing those things. But we will be um, thinking about um, how we replicate some of those efforts digitally. We're going to continue to do some um, trainings where we are hoping to release those low risk gambling guidelines and, um, and just doing as much um, communication as possible. One of the really cool things we're hoping to, to roll out in March is geofencing for um, employees and players so that they may hear more about um, RG when they're in the casino and on social media um, applications. So again, more on that and the results of that um, when we meet again. Next slide. And then finally, you know, we got to say a personal uh, goodbye because uh, Commissioner Sevens joined us uh, for one of our last meetings. Um, but he is just, um, you know, we just didn't want to miss the opportunity to say just uh, how excited we are for him, but also just how grateful we are for all his participation over the years. Um, you know, being one of the original um, commissioners, uh, he was with us from the beginning. He's always joined us with great spirit and interest. Um, always ask, ask very thoughtful questions. And I will say that, you know, it's always, I always think it's awesome how each commissioner brings their own kind of um, angle on how RG works at the commission. And um, Commissioner Stebbins was that obviously he well represented Western Massachusetts, wanted to make sure that we were really well connected out there um, and did a beautiful job of that. But he also made sure that um, veterans were a, a key component of our work, always asking the right questions, connecting us there as well as with older adults. So, um, you know, we're sad to see him go, but we're certainly happy for him in his next endeavor. And, um, I, you know, I hope he continues to wear his game since socks, even over the Cannabis Commission. So um, we're really uh, pleased for him and, and just wanted to send a public thank you out to him. He's not um, going to give those up, Marlene. He won't give those up. <laughs> I, I hope not. Um, <laughs> so with that, let me just close and, and say that, um, you know, that they're very kind. My team's very kind to give me a segment of this, but it, it's quite evident that they do this work beautifully on their own. Um, they're very accomplished. I'm, I couldn't kind of be more proud of them. Um, it's lovely to have Jody join us. I think she hasn't been before the Gaming Commission a while. And, um, you know, she talks about being uh, persistent and patient, and that's Two, two words, I, I couldn't think of any better words uh, to describe Jody and, um, and Lynn's enthusiasm certainly came through. So I'm going to stop talking so you can ask my team some more questions, but thank you again for the opportunity today. Thank you. Um, I think we just need to have, if you could take the slide down, um, that would be great so we could see our faces again. Thanks so much. Um, this has been a very thorough presentation and so interesting, and I only wish that time um, wasn't against us because uh, it was very, very interesting report. Um, but I do want to give each commissioner the opportunity to raise any questions. This is a quarterly report. Um, commissioner uh, Cameron, you're nodding your head. Did you want to make any comment or? I didn't have questions, but I do have a comment. Um, just how much I appreciate these, you know, we deal with so many difficult issues and, and you know, difficult votes and um, to always have the feel good from the game sense folks, meaning the anecdotal stories, the passion that comes from all the advisors 
and the, the really, really important work they do um, on behalf of the commission. It's just refreshing and uh, it's always one of my favorite uh, presentations of the many, many we have uh, during a year. So I just wanna thank everybody for the good work. It's so apparent that you're making a difference um, and, and at the same time, connecting with the licensees, making sure it's a partnership. So I, I don't think there's another story like it around. It, certainly not in this country. So, so again, thank you on behalf of the commission and uh, just, I know you'll keep up the good work. So thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Zuniga. Yeah, uh, along the same lines, thank you for uh, the thorough presentation. Uh, it's always good to see everybody. Um, there's, a, there's a theme that arises in my view out of, um, out of your presentation. Uh, and that is this adaptability to the conditions, the changing conditions and the environment in which we operate. And your ability to do the work that we always intended, that you always intended in many ways, uh, again, adapting to those uh, conditions. I had, and, and, and Chair Stein, Judge Stein also attended, uh, prior to this, I had an opportunity to attend a demonstration uh, with Chelsea, Teresa and Ray um, of the process, the detailed process that was only outlined today uh, for a voluntary self-exclusion being conducted entirely virtually, including the details that go in uh, ensuring the documentation is signed appropriately, reviewed uh, in conjunction with the person and it's understood um, in, in many ways. And I was really impressed at uh, the, the the robustness of that uh, process, one that uh, I think Chelsea correctly points out, will be uh, a benefit after uh, uh, when we're able to go back and do a lot of these uh, interactions, um, you know, uh, without that without any restrictions. This will be an option uh, for people to have at different hours, or because their comfort level is one in which they would prefer to be done uh, remotely. So um, thank you for the overview and thank you for all the work uh, that you continue to do. Thank, thank you. Commissioner O'Brien, did you have a comment? Um, just thank you. It's always a very detailed presentation and that's always I'm always struck by the dedication of everyone that's associated with the program. Um, I, I agree with everything that the other commissioners have said, and I look forward to uh, seeing you again on the 28th. So thank you, commissioners. And, and again, uh, thank you for um, each element was equally interesting. I do want to point out that um, I'm, I am looking forward to learning more about the uh, virtual uh, training uh, for the Asian community. I, that is a, a, a priority for um, for us, uh, and and I thank I thank um, I thank you for providing that today. And I always feel like it's just a tip of an iceberg, but a very thorough quarterly report. And I'm I'm so pleased, um, Marlene, with your entire team. We we know that they are extra eyes and ears um, on the gaming floor, and a unique resource that Massachusetts provides. And such critical outreach. And again, Mark, uh, your leadership is, is um, always tremendous. And we thank Teresa for her work um, uh, here too. And for Commissioner Zunica and I, we, we really appreciated uh, the um, Ray and Chelsea and Teresa's um, presentation the other day on, on the uh, virtual VSA, all great work. So thank you. Thanks again. And again, I wish that we didn't have such a, um, uh, robust agenda because we'd have 4,000 questions. So uh, please accept that as a form of apology from our thank, thank you. We appreciate the time. All right. Thank you. We do need to move on to our next um, business uh, director, Vanderlyn. Thank you so much. Item number seven, um, Dr. Langdown and, and, and Chad Bork, we um, do have a uh, Oh no, you know, I'm skipping. I'm skipping because I saw I saw Chad pop up. We do have um, first our presentation uh, from the IEB on two suitability uh, reports that we've had the chance to review in advance 
and give some comments back. Uh, so I think we're turning to Loretta and Kate. Thank you. That's Good great. Afternoon, Thank you. Kate. Thank you, Chair. Hello. And Kate will, Kate will handle these two uh, qualifiers, one for Encore and one for MGM Springfield. Uh, Excellent. Thanks, Kate. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, and I must extend my congratulations to Loretta. Um, oh, oh, excellent choice, and uh, certainly she's been such a great colleague to me and to all the members of the IEB, so congratulations. Thank, thanks so much, Kate. Look forward to continuing to work with you and, and with, with Erica in that division, so thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I do have two presentations for you this afternoon, uh, Chair and Commissioners. The first is um, a qualifier for MGM Springfield. This is Mr. Scott Wessel. Um, he is a corporate qualifier. He has submitted all of the required forms and complied with all of the IEB's requests for supplemental uh, and updated information throughout the course of the investigation. Uh, the IEB was able to conduct its complete protocol for suitability for casino qualifiers. We also confirmed financial stability and integrity, reviewed litigation history, searched criminal history, and verified that no prohibited political contributions were made in Massachusetts and conducted checks of open source and law enforcement databases as well. Uh, the team of investigators assigned to this background investigation was Trooper Kevin Owen of the Massachusetts State Police Gaming Enforcement Unit and financial investigator Matthew Jordan, both of whom are uh, able to join in on the meeting today. Uh, IEB investigators were able, uh, despite some pandemic measures, to interview Mr. Wessel through video conference. This happened on October 8th, 2020 at approximately 1.30 p.m. And the interview was conducted by both Trooper Owen and financial investigator Jordan. Mr. Wessel was noted to be cooperative and forthcoming in all aspects of the investigation. Uh, he has been employed by MGM Resorts International in various roles for approximately 25 years. He began in 1993 at Treasure Island, which uh, was a part of Mirage Resorts at the time. Uh, he then began as a guest services representative and was eventually promoted to assistant hotel manager. In 1999, Mr. Wessel left Treasure Island to further his education. He received a master's in 2000 and returned to the Mirage, which at that point had been purchased by MGM International. This was the beginning of his information technology career with MGM Resorts. And since 2001, Mr. Wessel has progressed through various information technology roles in the organization. He served as lead analyst, manager, director, executive director, vice president, and finally senior vice president. And he has held these positions in Las Vegas from 2001 to 2013, and then in Macau from 2013 to 2019. In 2019, when Mr. Wessel returned from Macau, he became the Senior Vice President of Business Systems for MGM Resorts, that's his current role. He's based in Las Vegas, and as Senior Vice President of Business Systems, he oversees the company's core technology group, this group includes all network and wireless communications throughout all MGM properties, and that would include MGM Springfield. He reports directly to Corey Sanders. Mr. Sanders is the chief operating officer who's based in Las Vegas. Um, and Mr. Wessel has a group of direct reports that include the vice president of information technology operations, the vice president of project management, as well as two executive directors that handle architecture and infrastructure and systems management. His daily functionality is akin to that of a chief information officer. Our background review did confirm that Mr. Wessel completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas, graduating in 1998 uh, with a Bachelor of Science degree in hotel administration. Subsequently, in 1999, Mr. Wessel attended the American Intercontinental University and received a master's degree in information technology. He completed that degree in 2000. It's noted that Mr. Wessel has gaming licenses and is in good standing with regulators in Nevada, Michigan, and Mississippi. And Mr. Wessel has demonstrated to the IEB by clear and convincing evidence that he is suitable. And the IEB recommends that the commission vote to find him suitable as a qualifier for MGM Springfield. Should we, and so let's uh, turn to this first report. Any questions for Kate as well as for Matt, who's on? Paul's also on, but I think with respect to the next report. That's correct. Thank you. Questions, very clear report. Um, Commissioner Cameron, I know often you you know that it's a clean report. Do you feel I do, that? I know that's a, that's a, I guess a term that doesn't go away easily. Yeah, and this one is exactly that. I mean, there were 
there were no issues whatsoever of uh, of investigative note with this report. I'd be happy to make a motion. Yeah, I'll just add that I thought it was a remarkable career that he's um, he has been able to really, um, with the expansion of his education, be able to come to the position that he's in. So uh, I like that story, but that's not really what we're looking at here. So we're looking at a different standard. Commissioner Cameron, your your um, motion. Madam Chair, I'd be happy to uh, move that we approve the suitability report of Mr. Scott. Russell, uh, he's an MGM qualifier and he serves as the Senior Vice President of Business Systems for MGM Resorts. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Barring any questions or discussion, I'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. And I vote yes, very well done again, Kate. Thank you for zero. Moving on to the next report. Thank you. My thanks to the investigative team uh, regarding Mr. Wessel. This next report is a little bit different. It's not uh, an individual qualifier. This is an entity qualifier for WinMass LLC, uh, Encore Boston Harbor. And this investigation was completed by Lieutenant Michael Banks of the Gaming Enforcement Unit and Financial Investigator Paul Eldridge. And I see Paul on the call. Um, and uh, this is an investigation of Wind Design and Development, LLC. Uh, so on October 8th of 2018, WinMass LLC, the Category 1 uh, casino licensee in Massachusetts, submitted the MGC's business entity disclosure form with applicable schedules for Wind Design and Development. Wind Design and Development was captured uh, as a casino entity qualifier under Massachusetts regulations which provide for the qualification of companies that have a business association of any kind with the applicant, as well as subsidiaries of the applicant. Um, and Wind Design and Development is in fact a wholly owned subsidiary of Wind Resorts Limited. Um, Wind Design and Development in itself does not own um, any subsidiaries. The company was founded as a domestic limited liability company in the state of Nevada in uh, May 18th of 2000 and is currently active with the Nevada Secretary of State. It's noted that the sole managing member is Wind Resorts Limited, uh, which is the ultimate parent company of Wind Mass LLC. Wind Design and Development uh, is an operational entity with approximately 150 employees in North America, as well as a small contingent in Macau. Uh, and Wind Design and Development is an agent for major construction projects and is principally located at 734 East Pilot Road in Las Vegas. The entity employs architects, interior designers and project managers and works only on wind construction and renovation projects. It does not work for other outside companies. Uh, and <clears throat> wind design and development uh, was reviewed, uh, as I stated, by financial investigator Paul Eldridge, and it was noted to have internally compiled, not audited financial statements with minimal transactions and balances consistent with its structure. Uh, regarding qualifiers, uh, the IEB conducted a review of the business entity disclosure form and also other supplemental documents that were provided by wind design and development and determined that Ellen Whittemore who's an individual qualifier for Mass LLC, is associated with Wind Design and Development by virtue of her role as secretary for Wind Design and Development. The IEB confirmed that Ms. Whittemore has been deemed suitable by the MGC as a qualifier for Wind Mass LLC and is currently in good standing. And in addition, Wind Resorts Limited itself is an entity qualifier for Wind Mass LLC and has already been found suitable by the commission. They remain in good standing. Uh, further, in terms of the financial evaluation conducted, uh, of this qualifying entity, the IEB uh, was able to review additional financial statements to confirm that, in fact, uh, this is a wholly owned subsidiary of Win Resorts Limited. In terms of gaming licensure, Win Design and Development does not itself hold gaming licenses in any jurisdiction. Instead, this entity refers to its ultimate parent company, Win Resorts Limited, uh, and the licenses that Win Resorts Limited holds. Uh, suitability has been determined for Win Resorts in Nevada and Macau and these both remain in good standing. In terms of compliance and regulatory history for this entity, Wind Design and Development does not have an independent compliance committee, nor does it have an independent audit committee. However, there would be standard reporting under the Wind Resorts Limited Compliance Program uh, or reporting under the Wind Resorts Limited Audit Committee, depending on the activity and whether or not that activity met the requirements for reporting to those committees. 
regarding criminal history when design and development does not have a criminal history. And the investigative team discovered no significant issues or concerns during the course of its uh, investigation into wind design and development. So based upon the review of the submitted application, the supplemental material, and the independent analysis conducted, the IEB finds no reason why wind design and development should not be deemed suitable by the commission. And therefore, the IEB recommends that the commission make a positive finding of suitability for this entity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, again, very thorough report. Um, I know that um, I had a couple of, of questions and, and you did clarify those in a revised version of the, um, of the memo that we've had a chance to review. Very helpful uh, to Paul and, and to Matt. Thank you, Matt, for your work on the last report and Paul this is a, a somewhat of a different report than what we're used to, so thank you for your input and your um, your review. Questions on the corporate structure? Looks like Commissioner Zuniga is shaking, you know, nodding no, shaking his head no. All set. All set. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Cameron, Commissioner O'Brien, any questions on this uh, structure? I know Commissioner O'Brien too, you may have asked a couple of clarifying questions. I did, which resulted in some of the editing in the revised memo I think that was distributed yesterday. The only thing I would just point out too is that a little bit of the delay was because of the corporate restructuring. Sometimes we have questions about timing and so it was, I just wanted to point that out too, that there was an element of that that went into why there was a delay and when it was deemed qualified and when we're hearing about it. That's right. I thank you too for the footnotes. <laughs> Always helpful. Um, so again, um, the fact that we may not be asking any questions is really probably an indicator of the thoroughness of these reports. Uh, they are well done and the investigative team is so strong. So we thank you. Barring no further questions, Commissioner, um, is there a commissioner who wants to move on this? Yeah, Madam Chair, I'll be happy to move that uh, the Commission find wind design and development um, suitable to be uh, to call the gaming uh, to be a qualifier entity qualifier. I'm sorry, as, uh, as submitted in the packet and discussed here today. A second. Second. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. Again, a, a big thank you to the team, Kate, Paul, Matt. It's great to see your faces and thank you for the hard work. Um, Loretta, thank you to your team. Um, barring any further discussion, we'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes. Again, four zero. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the thorough work. Your brief. Um, your brief appearance today is no indicator of the amount of work that it takes to get there. So we all acknowledge that and thank you for your thoroughness and your diligence. Well, thank you so much and thanks to the team. It's definitely a group effort. Thank you. Okay, so we are all set and I think we can now move on to Chad and Dr. Lightbound's report. Number seven, um, you have the quarterly local aid payment. Good afternoon. Uh, I wanted to uh, congratulate Loretta. Um, it's been work, uh, great working with her so far, and I'm sure we continue to be that way, and it's well deserved. And um, now Thank I'll you. turn it over to Chad. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon and happy new year. Uh, happy today. New year. Thank you. Uh, today uh, I have the local aid, and which is payable to each city and town where racing activities are conducted. Today's payment request is for the quarter ending December 31st. Uh, aid for this quarter was calculated by using handles that took place in April, May, and June of this year. Um, it, it should be noted that there was no live racing or wagering at the facilities. Uh, this was due to governor's COVID-19 orders. So all the activity for the period was generated through account deposit wagering providers. Um, that said, uh, the amount for the city of Boston uh, is $160,454.13. Uh, 
The town of Plainville is $3,556.62, and the city of Revere is $80,225.86 for a total amount of $244,236.61. In, in your packet, you will see a breakdown of the handles and also the calculation for each city and town. And uh, this does require your approval. Thank you. Questions for uh, Dr. Lightbound and Chad. Okay, again, uh, this is um, a straightforward report. Um, the number of questions that we're asking is not an indicator of the good work that Chad has to do to get here. So thank you. Um, I think uh, we can probably move then. You do need a formal vote. Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, I would uh, move that the commission approve disbursement to the communities uh, for the local aid uh, payments uh, as outlined in the packet. Uh, the local aid quarterly distribution for quarter four of calendar year 2020, uh, totaling $244,236.61 as outlined in the commission's packet. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cameron. All right. No further questions or clarifications. All right. We'll take the call the vote. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zinnica? Aye. Can I vote? Aye. Right. Yes. Thank you. Five, four, zero. All right. So we've gotten through uh, much of our, our presentations today, but we do have some important commissioner updates and some business to take care of. Um, starting first with uh, Commissioner O'Brien on the evaluative process for the ED. I believe the forms that we talked about um, with Commissioner Seven at the last meeting were distributed to all of you. Um, really, it's unless somebody wanted changes on it, it's a question of moving forward and setting up a timeline um, with Karen's input in terms of how much time she would need to, to write hers and then how much time we think we would need to respond. So can I ask a clarifier? It, it, the process would be we first get, we first hear from, from Karen and then we respond um, and, we, and we would, she would receive our individual input and then we would have our public evaluation that's required correct all right so the forms would be distributed and then returned back through hr and then they would give her the individual ones from each of us so there's no risk of us violating any sort of open meeting or restrictions in terms of talking amongst ourselves until we got to the public discussion perfect thank you so, um, commissioners, what do you think in terms of timing? And then we'll see if Karen, that works for Karen. It's today is, okay, so today is January 14th. We have another public meeting, the 28th, and then we have another one two weeks into February, the 13th, I think. Commissioner Cameron? Um, I mean, I, I, I don't think any of us will have a problem uh, preparing our section within a two week period. I guess I'm just, um, I know there is some work from HR to do at that point, distributions to make. So I'm wondering if we should start the process now with the thought of having it completed by that first meeting in February. Yeah, the only thing I, I'm happy to hear from Karen too, in terms of, I know being the ED, she's got other things on her plate. And while this is very important, I also, want to be flexible enough to make it fit in so with whatever's coming up in the next couple of weeks so things you sure Brian, you, to you're evolve. expecting, a, you're expecting <laughs> a long document from the executive director i think no but i think we've all been there you know having to yeah, yeah. they can be painful you know even the best ones are painful so uh, karen i meant to do yourself not yours karen i just meant to have <laughs> yourself <-valuate. laughs> you had her nervous 
<laughs> and I haven't seen it, the document, so that part of this is hard for me to gauge because I haven't seen anything yet. So uh, it's hard for me to say how long it would take to fill out. But the bottom line is it's got to get done. So whatever it takes to get it done, I'll get it done. Right. And, and I think it's, if I'm understanding it correctly, it looks as though it's the, the same document that the executives have been, or the, the the director level folks have been using, am I right? I mean, it's very it's very similar to what had been used with the ED in the past. Uh, the only thing that was added was a couple of questions about um, very specific professional goals for the ED, at carving out professional personal goals versus um, goals for the position and the entity as a whole. But very very similar to, in that regard to what had been done in the past. So. So what if, what if we do this, um, have Karen, you know, she can take a look at it and, and shoot for that second, for that first meeting in February. And if it turns out that we need more time, we'll, we'll push it off another couple of weeks. But I do think getting into the cadence of close to annual is what we're shooting for. So, right? Um, yep. We need a vote. I don't know that we need a vote. It was marked up for a vote, but um, I don't know. I leave it to Todd to say, I don't know that we need a vote. No, I think there's a consensus. I think that's good enough for this. Yeah. Amika, you're, you're okay with this as well? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy with the form. I'm happy with the time frame, and uh, I'm happy with the approach that you outline, um, Kathy. So yeah, let's come back and review it if, we need to, if, if necessary. But yeah, and the it's approach was one I was I wasn't I wasn't promoting the approach. I was guessing it, but it sounds like it was aligned with what Commissioner O'Brien was thinking. All right, okay. All right. Okay, so we have some work to do on that front, but we're all set with the um the uh the forms themselves. Excellent. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. Yes. And Commissioner, right. former Commissioner Stebbins in absentia. Yeah, I know. We he he was involved, but I don't know. He escaped this part of the duty. <laughs> Good. Okay, but his green socks were highlighted, and I love that today. So um, he's made his appearance one way or another today. All right. So then we would move on to the last two items, which are pretty straightforward. Um, I'll explain to you what I've done. Um, as you know, uh, with respect to uh, item eight B. Um, Section 3F of 23K requires that the commission annually um, elect a secretary. Commissioner Stebbins did serve in that capacity and we had um, recently elected him to that role. I've had the chance to speak with Commissioner O'Brien to ask about whether she would be willing to um, serve in this capacity. And I think it's fair to say that yes, um, she is willing, but I do, I think she and I both agree that um, the way that we could go forward on this is to perhaps look at it as not an interim election, but an election that will stand during this interim period where we don't have a full slate of commissioners. And when we come, when we do have a, again, a slate of five commissioners, we could revisit this election. Um, does that, uh, if, if that makes sense, and, and Commissioner O'Brien is still in agreement to serve, I would invite um, uh, a, a, a motion for one of you to move on that, but let's have discussion. Uh, Madam Chair, I do not want to give Commissioner O'Brien a chance to change her mind, so I would be happy to make a motion. <laughs> no, and I thank Commissioner O'Brien in all seriousness. This is, a, this is an important responsibility, so I, 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 I am grateful that you're willing to serve in an interim period. Um, and, and I know that Todd is working with, um, with Karen and team to sort of think about um, a, a maybe a, perhaps a more condensed template for our, our minutes uh, to make it um, inefficient and, and not such a necessarily torturous process for whoever has to pick up that, um, you know, that laboring or which Shara did. So there's some work going on on just the, uh, the, the way the minutes are presented in any case to make create some efficiencies. So um, I do thank Commissioner O'Brien and uh, for that. And I thank Commissioner Cameron for her motion. Do I have a second? No, I'm going to admit, let me make the motion first, uh, Madam Chair. Oh, I, I thought just, you did. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't really put it in the form of a motion. I'm sorry, I just didn't I'm, want, I'm I didn't so want the commissioner to change her mind. So I'd be happy okay, to good. move. 
that the um, the commission um, approve uh, Commissioner Eileen O'Brien to serve as our treasurer, um, oh, MPC, secretary. Uh, secretary, oh, secretary. I'm sorry, as the secretary <laughs> in the interim period. Well, we have four commissioners. Uh, I second that. Perfect. With Thank you. With the clarification. Yes. yes. <laughs> and 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 thank you so much for uh, keeping me on on the process. Uh, uh, it's getting a little bit of a long meeting, so um, I'm hearing what I want to hear. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, uh, barring any further discussion and no objection, um, I will in, invite um, the commissioners. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, you may I know decide to recuse, but Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Abstain. Okay, abstain. And Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. And I vote yes. So it's 3 0. And, and again, thank you, Commissioner O'Brien, for taking this on at this time. We appreciate it. Then we're moving on to, again, another um, item of business around uh, the departure of uh, Commissioner Stebbins. And that's in Section 68 of 23K. The Commission does um, have to appoint. Um, a representative of the commission to serve on the subcommittee for community mitigation. Um, and so I've had a chance to speak with Commissioner Zuniga. He did uh, uh, work with Commissioner Stebbins and Joe Delaney and team on community mitigation um, grants uh, last year. It made uh, sense to, for me to reach out to him and he too is willing um, to take on that responsibility. And I think we should probably um, again, make it a uh, 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 selection during this interim period while we don't have a complete slate of uh, commissioners. And then we can revisit this, um, this designation, if you will, or appointment uh, 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 at that time as well. Does that, um, does that make sense, Commissioner Zuniga? Yeah, it does. And um, this one, in, 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 in my opinion, um, is, uh, is a great way for anybody to come in and either serve, uh, who is new to the commission, to either serve or learn uh, in, a, in a, an observer capacity. We have the up to two commissioner uh, uh, process. To also learn about a program that is really um, good and beneficial and a, lot, a big part of what we do. Yeah, with really uh, far reaching touches so you can learn a lot about the work of the agency. So at this point, uh, Commissioner Zuniga, if we do um, confirm today, then you would become the chair of the, um, I guess you'd be, you'd be on the um, subcommittee, and then within that subcommittee, they select the chair. Um, so we'll leave that process for the subcommittee, and then I, I would um, ask if you're willing to continue to support the work of, of um, uh, uh, Joe and team, and um, and, and continue on that front, and we'll revisit it once we have another commissioner join us. So, Absolutely. So thank you. So we'll need a, a motion, please. So, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to move that we appoint Commissioner Zuniga to serve on the MGC Community Mitigation Subcommittee in the interim basis more before we have a fifth commissioner. Second. Thank you. Um, barring no further discussion, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Abstain. Thank you. And I'll vote yes. So 3 0. Thank you so much. And again, to my colleagues, thank you for stepping up to these important roles. We appreciate Welcome it. Welcome aboard, Enrique. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> there he is. Yes. I'm already so that's a little perfect. familiar with, but yeah, thank you. Thank, oh, and there's Mary Thurl giving a double thumbs up. So we're all set. Thank you so much. So that concludes um, uh, item number eight. Is there any other business that my fellow commissioners wish to bring forward today? All right. Now, um, it is um, almost 1.30. We anticipate, um, and I'm going to go through the executive sessions, even though it says lunch, the, the process um, would be that we need to decide whether we are going to go into executive session, I believe on five different um, uh, matters. Uh, it does require me to read this into the record and then we'll have um, motions to follow in, and a vote to decide whether we in fact will go 
um, into executive session on all of these specific matters. So thank you for, um, for hearing me out and then we'll figure out our lunch break. Um, so the commission anticipates that it will meet in executive session in accordance with GL chapter 30A, section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to FBT Everett Realty LLC versus MGC versus Wynn Mass LLC as discussion at an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the commission. And the public uh, session of the commission meeting will not reconvene at the conclusion of the executive session. Do I have a motion? Yes, Madam Chair, I would move that the commission vote to enter into the executive session for the purposes that you just described. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Cameron. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. So, yes, floor zero. Thank you. Moving on to um, item subsection B. The commission anticipates that it will meet in executive session in accordance with GL chapter 38, section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to MGC versus landmark American insurance as discussion at an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the commission. The public session of the commission meeting will not reconvene at the conclusion of the executive session. Motion? Um, Madam Chair, I, I move that we meet in executive session with respect to MGC versus Landmark American Insurance uh, as discussed. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. And I vote yes, three, four, zero. Thank you. Moving on to subsection C, the commission anticipates that it will meet an executive session in, session in accordance with GL chapter 30A, section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to City of Revere and Mohegan Sun, Massachusetts LLC versus Massachusetts Gaming Commission as discussion at an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the commission. Public session of the commission meeting will not reconvene at the conclusion of the executive session. So. Madam Chair, I move that the commission go into executive session connection with City of Revere and Mohegan Sun Mass LLC versus Mass Gaming Commission as discussed. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron will have the second and we will go for the vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes, four zero. Thank you so much. And now for the final, oh no, it isn't the final. This is D, correct? Yes. Yes. Feels like it should be, the, I'm on five, but I'm only on four. The commission anticipates that it will meet in executive session in accordance with GL chapter 30A, section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to the Cosmo versus Blue Tarp Ray Development, LLC et al, and Trister v. Encore Boston Harbor et al, as discussion at an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the commission. The public session of the commission meeting will not reconvene at the conclusion of the executive session. Madam Chair, I would move that we uh, vote to go into executive session for the purposes that you just described. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. And I vote yes. Now for item E, uh, Todd, I'm just gonna look for some guidance. I'm gonna read this, but should I also add that we won't reconvene um, in public session? Yes, I think that's, that's is that Because that, that is the case. All right, good, thank you. The commission anticipates that it will meet in executive session to review minutes uh, from previous executive sessions. And again, the public session of the, of the commission meeting will not reconvene at the conclusion of that executive session. I move, uh, Madam Chair, I move that the commission enter executive session to review the meetings, the meeting minutes of prior executive sessions uh, as Second. discussed here today. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Cameron. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. 
Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. And I vote yes. So now before we do, we will have to formally adjourn this public meeting, correct, Todd? Yes. Okay. Yes. Is that that or do we and Commissioner? I thought Brian, we went into executive session and then just adjourned in the executive session or no? Yes, actually, I think either way works works well. Uh, we've made clear that we're not coming back into public session. So as long as the okay. meeting is adjourned at some point. We'll adjourn it in the executive session. Thank you. Now, in, um, we just have the logistics. Um, Todd, I presume that you have notified council that we are running a little bit later than anticipated? Yes, we have. Okay, and we're all set on all five items. Um, how much of a break do we need? Um, it is 1.30. Does, does it make sense to convene at 2? That's fine by me. I can do that. Okay, and it works for the um, outside council, Todd? I believe so, yes. That should be good. Karen, uh, does that work for you and your team? I think so, yes. Yeah. Okay, then um, I guess that we we will go into the executive session in no formal motion for adjournment at this time. We'll do that when we when we depart from our executive session. To everyone who participated in today's meeting and who joined us for today's meeting, thank you. Um, a great deal of work went into each and every item. We extend our congratulations to Loretta Lilios, and we also extend our very best wishes for everyone as we start this new year. Stay safe, everyone, and um, we'll see you at our next meeting. Congratulations, Loretta. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.